the yield curve, the labor market, and risk assets are all saying very different things at the moment. We're all subject to the data. Inflation is what the Fed's going to focus on. It's hard to see inflation pressures easing off completely. I don't think we're going to see inflation neatly fitting back into this 2% box anytime soon. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bramford, Sam Jonathan Farrow. TK back tomorrow. Equity futures positive, about two-tenths of one percent. The main event really in the last couple of days, Bramo, has been China and the events over the weekend. The protest and what Chinese authorities would do, back away from COVID zero or not. It seems like there's going to be some kind of a vaccine drive in the world's second largest economy. For older people, just like we were talking about yesterday, why don't they accelerate some of the uh, vaccination programs for people who are over the age of 65? Because it's a significant proportion of the population, too. It's not like this is a small proportion. They're willing to do that, but they're also cracking down pretty harshly on some of these protests. I've been confused by it over the last couple of years, never mind the last couple of months. We'll catch up with Ender Curran in Hong Kong a little bit later this morning. Got to talk about the data out of Europe, too. Softer CPI out of Spain. Yeah. We've had the regional stuff across Germany. So far, so good. Easing just a little bit. Maybe some good news for the Europeans this morning. Correct. Although, why? The why is interesting. This is fuel and energy costs because they did not necessarily go up as much as people had previously expected. You do see uh, some sort of uh, input from the fact that it has been a warmer than expected winter. At what point does that make them vulnerable if there aren't other inputs that are also slowing? ECB on December 15th, mm -hmm. Federal Reserve December 14th. Colby Smith over at the FT caught up with Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Fed yesterday. This line from Loretta Mester, the cost of stopping too early are high. We want to be very diligent about this. You just wonder how much that weighs them down going into their decision in December. Well, and this is Bill Dudley's point, too, and Bill Dudley, the former New York Fed president, joining us uh, later in the show. How much are they concerned about the fact that if they let inflation get away from them, they end up with a situation where they've got to clamp down much harder and they're not going to go to a 3% level, right? Like, that's sort of some of the speculation from the Adam Posen's of the world. Why not let it float to 25 to 3% in terms of an inflation target? A lot of people pushing back and saying, we cannot do that because this is our mandate and we could potentially really more the economy. So if you had a crystal ball, you'd want to know two things for next year. We've been talking about it. One is China, two is the Fed. And if you had a crystal ball, you'd come up with your outlook and Bank of America seemingly have their crystal ball and they've come up with their outlook. Savita so Subramaniam, 4,000 on the S&P 500 year and not this year, next year. 2023. Very interesting, very much in line with really what we're hearing from Morgan Stanley and Mike Wilson. But that's what I was going to say. This is actually consensus that we're going to bump along to the same place that we're at right now and it's going to be bumpy but it's going to be really under the index that you're going to see a lot of the shift and a lot of the friction. The crystal ball is interesting at a moment where there's so many variables and what I find interesting is that crystal ball pushes back against the Fed and says the Fed, we don't buy it. You can come out with all your hawk hawkish prognostications. We're still going to price in hikes by the end of next year. We're still going to go with what we think because you're probably going to be wrong. Rate cuts, rate cuts, and they're saying we're not going to get rate cuts. Futures right now on the S&P 500, positive two-tenths of 1%, up about a quarter of 1%. No real drama here. In a bond market in Europe, big rally off the back of some of that CPI data. We'll talk about that a little bit later. A rally in symphony, in sympathy rather, in the Treasury market. <laughs> symphony too many. Early days, same thing. Yields are lower by three basis points. On a 10-year right now, 364.97. In the FX market, some euro strength for you. Euro dollar positive by four-tenths of 1%. Lisa, euro dollar 103.85. Yeah, I what you talked about earlier about some of the inflation reads that we got out of Europe, really interesting to me. The fact that we got softer than expected in uh, Spain. And then when you look at the granular ones over in Germany and the different regions, they point to a similar kind of trend. We get at ADM, uh, Germany, overall inflation for November. We're expecting it to tick down just a touch. That's a Bloomberg economics and sort of the average of analysts uh, surveyed by Bloomberg. How much, though, is going to be comforting before you get a different message from an ECB that has the same fear that the Fed does, which is let inflation get away and the underpinnings of it without clamping down harshly now. At 9 a.m., we get a host of housing data out of the U.S., including the S&P Core Logic Case Shiller 20 City Home Price Index for the month of September. How much do we see that acceleration of the decline in home prices? This, to me, is a leading indicator, and it also takes out some of the uh, confidence of consumers and the buying power, especially uh, for people who are middle income, and that's something people have been watching. And at 11.30 a.m., a news conference by NATO Secretary uh, Ye uh, General General Jens Stoltenberg. He has a meeting with Secretary of State Tony Blinken in the U.S. Yes, he's talking about Ukraine. They're doubling down on what's going to happen there. But expect China to be front and center, too. That's what a lot of people are saying. Do you think the housing data needs a rebrand? To Just what? To rename 
whatever that data is. You mean you don't like saying the S&P CoreLogic Case Shiller 20 City Home Price Index? No. <laughs> Can we shorten it to something else? What would else? you like to call it? I don't know. Home data. We call it the Case Shiller data if you want. But there's, well, like, different the sets logic. of it. OK, we're going to solve this a little bit later. It's like the shoe debate. Yeah. How much feedback did you get about the shoe debate yesterday? I mean, the, I got, on, I got some. Off. Did you get a lot of feedback? Tons. Really? And people were all with you, or are they basically pushing back and saying it's kind of... Most, most of my friends on board. You're, you're threading a, a needle here, because you're basically saying you as an individual should respect what other people do, but you as a host should not impose your view aggressively. But Correct. you can judge later. Correct. Yeah, OK. And if Got you're not it. up to speed with the debate from yesterday, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> Tony Crescenti yes. joins us now, portfolio manager and market strategist at PIMCO. Tony, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. I want to start with a number. Done, Lisa. Negative 77 basis points on the yield curve in America, the two-year versus the 10-year. And I want to understand from your perspective and the team at PIMCO, Tony, how much signal can you take away from that yield curve right now? Well, there's a significant amount of signal in the yield curve. It's a reliable indicator, as you know. Uh, but that number you referenced, John, is similar to what's called the term premium, uh, which is the, the difference between the future short-term interest rates and that long-term rate. Typically, there's a term premium in a long-term interest rate, meaning that an investor says uh, he, she, it wants uh, additional yield for stepping out on the yield curve because there is more risk in stepping out on the yield curve. But these days, and for a long time now, the last six years, especially the last decade, investors haven't uh, demanded much in the way of a term premium. Is it related to the Fed? It could be. Think about it this way. We know that lots of shelves were, were cleaned out during the pandemic. Uh, we saw supply chain problems, some stuff missing. There's still stuff missing from the shelves in the sense that the Fed took a lot of bonds off the shelves, trillions of dollars worth. It's only putting a few back at a time. So that keeps the term premium suppressed. So there is a bit of a distortion in that sense, but markets clearly are de uh, deciding that uh, there are risks, elevated risks toward recession next year. And Tony, a lot of people are going into longer duration because they do see the proposition of growth over the longer term really coming down dramatically. We were talking yesterday with Brian Weinstein of Morgan Stanley, and he said he could see a three and a quarter a percent 10 year Treasury yield before this rally is over. And he could see that yield curve inversion going to negative 125 basis points. Do these potential outcomes seem probable to you? It is possible. Uh, Tara is the new investment mantra, in fact. And a lot of investors are talking about the idea that there are reasonable alternatives rather than the old Tina. Tina's exited. Tara's entered the building. Tina was said there is no alternative. Now that yields are up, uh, there are. Now, think about it this way as well. The, the boomers are aging. 1957 was the biggest birth year of the century. So this year is the biggest year for retirements uh, in, in history. Uh, this wave lasts through 2030. Think of the boomer mentality in the 2010s. They probably thought they'd never, ever see uh, interest income as part of their future uh, earnings story, but now they do. And so they will keep pushing back, you could say, on these higher yields when they happen because they'll say, well, thank goodness, now I, have, I can rely perhaps on interest income. Plus, there are numerous other reasons uh, why investors might want fixed income. And uh, so they could push into yields. And what I'm trying to say is that there will be non-economic reasons in a sense, but it's economic, of course, if you're a retire retired individual, uh, for uh, wanting to um, explore fixed income today because th there are reasonable alternatives and yields do look good relative to future inflation, relative to the long term average and as a hedge against future uh, recession risk because bonds do tend to outperform equities and credit in cases like that. So what's your highest conviction uh, move ahead of next year, especially given that people are already rewriting the 2023 outlooks? The biggest uh, um, area of conviction that one should have entering 2023, and it isn't easy, is to have to expect that interest rate volatility will plunge next year relative to 2022, uh, because the forecast miss on the federal funds rate is highly likely to be a lot smaller next year than it was this year. The Fed, others expected the funds rate to end at 1%. It's ending near 5%. What are the odds of a four-point miss next year? What if it's one percentage point miss uh, next year, and the markets think it's a 6% funds rate instead of 5 where it's priced now? You'd see the type of repricing in markets that you saw most of this year, but it probably wouldn't go that far because it seems like between the three F's, the Fed, fiscal policy, and financial conditions, it will be enough to cause meaningful disinflation and that, uh, therefore, uh, the lower interest rate volatility will benefit lots of assets, agency mortgage-backed securities, for one, 
ultimately credit, ultimately equities, et cetera. But um, the, the real volatility might be in spreads in the bond market, not in interest rates. Hey, Tony, can we get a forecast for Team USA today at the World Cup against Iran? You've got a number for us. I'm a baseball player, so you're oh. asking the wrong person, John. Exactly. But uh, one of Tom Keane's mates. Say, go USA. I can only say I'm sitting in the United <laughs> States. I'm a oh, no, it's just ridiculous. Citizen. Let's you're... go with the United States. It's, it's, it's not ridiculous. Tony, thank you. Tony, thank you. <laughs> Tony Crescenzi of PIMCO. It's one of Tom's mates. No, can I just say I love... It's one of Tom's mates. You did something today, and I want you to do it every day. What's so, that? What do you want me to do? You, you put out every morning a morning note on Twitter, and you put sort of top stories, and they typically And then the stuff here. I actually cared and about. And then you put out the stuff that you actually cared about, which Bonotto quitting Ferrari. He is the, the uh, team Formula principal One. of the yeah, Ferrari exactly. team, yeah. Um, um, Juve's board resigns. Yep. Yeah. And uh, the Group B final games. Yeah, I And I that's what you care about. Yeah, exactly. And so you're basically like, you know... This is what I'm supposed to I'm still to going to talk this about, is, this is I'm what still going to talk to talk about, about market stuff. That's what I get paid to talk about. And <laughs> I assume I get paid to talk about some sports stuff now and then as well. Yeah, but, you, you know. know, yeah. And actually, I will say that in, five, in four years' time in the U.S., I'm going to guess that more people will have cogent responses to you with respect to football games. This is why I'm so bullish, Team USA. I want to see them do really, really well. Because what's good for them is good for the sport. <laughs> Honestly, I truly believe that. If we can have a really, really strong... U.S. men's football team in the same way we have a really, really strong U.S. women's football team. I think it could be absolutely fantastic for the sport in four years' time when the World Cup is hosted in North America. It's actually gaining so much traction in part great. because parents don't want their kids playing traditional football. They want to play soccer. No, the problem That's is actually it's it. the boomers like Tony pushing the bonds, pushing the treasuries on people in retirement. We still like baseball. Oh, my God. It's, it's no, no, no. That, you took this a step too far. All, all I like baseball, too. You cannot underprime baseball. It's the boomers. Oh, Jesus. It's, it's you, you, you had me. You had me. It's and the then, boom. Send by treasuries. Yeah. And, mm. uh, blame mm. Tom's generation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's good that blame he's Tom not here. For everything. <laughs> Evan Brown of UBS is coming up in the next hour. Looking forward to that. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. You lost me too, Jonathan. All right, keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Federal Reserve policymakers are stressing that more interest rate hikes are on the way to curb inflation. New York Fed President John Williams told reporters that he sees rates heading somewhat higher than he had forecast just a few months ago. Meanwhile, St. Louis Fed President James Bullard says that markets are underpricing the chance of higher rates. China plans to increase COVID vaccinations among its senior citizens. It's a step that health experts regard as crucial to reopening an economy stuck in harsh COVID zero restrictions. Still, Beijing stopped short of announcing mandates that helped raise inoculation rates in other countries. The move comes after a weekend of protests demanding an end to COVID limits. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says the UK cannot rely on what he called simplistic Cold War rhetoric against China. In his first major foreign policy speech as premier, Sunak also said it would be naive to think that trade would lead to social and political reform. He said that China cannot be ignored, especially on issues such as global economic stability or climate change. And you'll have to wait a little bit longer for that new iPhone. COVID lockdowns and worker protests at Apple's key assembly plant in China have delivery times for the iPhone 14 Pro models in the U.S. as long as 37 days. That's according to Counterpoint Research. Apple is expected to face a shortfall of 6 million iPhone Pro units this year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Our message to peaceful protesters around the world uh, is the same and, and consistent. People should be allowed uh, uh, the, the, the right to assemble and to peacefully protest policies or laws or dictates that, uh, that they take issue with. We're watching this closely, as you might expect we would. And again, we continue to stand up and support the right of peaceful protest. That was John Kirby, the White House National Security Council spokesperson responding to the events in China. Over the weekend, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Equity futures just about positive, up two tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. Chairman Powell speaking tomorrow on Wednesday. And then you get payrolls data on Friday. Yields are coming in a couple of basis points, down two basis points on a ten-year to 365.71. Here's a line from the President of the United States. He was speaking in the Rose Garden. 
Here's the quote. Good morning, everyone. As you might guess, I am very pleased to announce a tentative labour agreement between that has been reached between the railway workers and the railway companies. This agreement is a big win for America and for both, in my view. You know when that was? That was September 15th, Ramo. September 15th. And the 12 unions, all 12 unions, failed to sign up to that tentative agreement. We got a problem. And how does this president deal with it? Because he is the president of unions. And this is interesting. So he comes out and he's asking Congress for help to force some sort of deal here because some of the unions won't sign on to this. How does he message this in a way where he still sounds pro-union, even though he is going above them and injecting Congress? Anne-Marie is back in town, I'm pleased to say. AMH, welcome back. Down in Washington, D.C. Anne-Marie, walk us through what's happened here, why this is broken down and what's on the table now. Well, for the labor unions, it really comes down to this paid time off. They want this medical leave, and they say that's even more important than raise wages. So that's why you see one of the biggest labor unions, or the biggest labor union voted this down and that's really when tensions started to rise and it looked like they wouldn't be able to get this agreement they have till December 9th to try to negotiate this but clearly that's just around the corner and the White House doesn't look like that's happening so now the president is out with a statement calling on Congress could Congress could be the ones to step in to avoid a strike and what the president was trying to say yesterday in the statement I'll bring you some of that he is saying let me be clear a rail shutdown would devastate our economy to Lisa's point at the same time he was saying, I am one of the most pro-union presidents we have in modern times, yet what he's concerned about is the havoc this would wreak on the U.S. economy, especially going into the holiday season. What's the deal here going on behind the scenes, why this wasn't signed on to by all of the unions, especially if freight rail companies are urging Congress to act quickly? Yes, we know this because the workers are the ones that are basically protesting. But on the flip side, there are some unions that also would like to see this agreement ratified. There are some unions that already signed off on it, right? But you have to get all 13. And that's where the issue came down to. Not all of them were able to get all the votes needed from every single member is voting on this. So you have the top leaders negotiating at a, a table. And I met some of them that day in the Rose Garden and talking to them and all the coffee and the sleep uh, they were expected to need because they were working around the clock. But then members need to vote for this. And they see this as a moment in time where they can use this leverage right now. There are supply chain issues. We're going into Christmas. And there's a president that says he supports labor unions. So they feel like at this moment, they could probably extract some of those demands. And for for them, that's going to be medical paid time off. Emory, I'm glad that you mentioned the supply chain disruptions because that is the broader backdrop for this. This president wants to see those supply chain disruptions ameliorated to alleviate some of the inflationary pressure. We're seeing that with the rails. We're seeing this over in China. How is the U.S. dovetailing their message with the Communist Party over in China in terms of wanting to end COVID zero while also encouraging companies in the U.S. to diversify some of their supply chains away from just their reliance on that nation? Well, you heard what Admiral Kirby says. He says they're watching these protests carefully. Quite a muted response from the White House. That statement about the fact that they support peaceful protests around the world could be said for a number of protests happening right now in countries. Iran as well comes to mind. But the fact that they're watching these protests in China carefully is all they've said or closely, and they don't see an impact yet on supply chains. But of course, as you said, Lisa, behind the scenes, or even more so out front, the U.S. and the money they're putting into the United States in terms of semiconductor chip building, one, but also the rallying behind the business community and other countries around the world to divest away from China and to make sure that there are other supply chain routes, because that is what the pandemic really exposed, this reliance on China, just similarly in Europe, it's reliance on Russian gas and oil, the fact that the West is too reliant on some of these countries. Uh, so it's an interesting moment right now with China. But the U.S., the administration hasn't come out and really said something direct or emphatic about these protests, just that they're watching them closely, but they don't see a hit to supply chain. Amitch, how did some of this play out at the G20? When it comes to su supply chains, a lot of what the G20 cares about, what the United States cares about, is making sure they're shoring up these allies in like places like India, et cetera, that they can have stronger supply chain outlets. And you do see some companies moving what potentially would have been a factory in China to a factory in India. Um, the United States wants to make sure that they are there as a partner for some of these developing countries 
to be another uh, lifeline instead of going through China, whether or not that's for debt sustainability and relief and working that out, or whether that comes to supply chain access. Amory, great to have you back in a seat down in Washington, D.C. AMH there back with us here at Bloomberg. Clearly, there's been a change in the labor market, a massive change. We were talking about the amount of leverage that employees had over the last 18 months. There seems to be a shift. And you can see that, I think, in the communication coming from a company like Snapchat. There's real tension now in tech across major companies. don't know if you'd consider Snap a major company. But this line from Evan Spiegel about getting back to the office yeah. for 80% of the time, what each of us may sacrifice in terms of our individual convenience, I believe we will reap in terms of our collective success. Does that kind of communication, dare I say that cult-like stuff, really resonate with people anymore at tech firms? Given what you've seen take place at Meta, massive cuts. If you drink the Kool-Aid, does it make a difference? Is it really uh, getting through, or is it basically just saying, come back to work four days a week, this is what we need from you? Sure. If you don't, we're not going to have you still here. Can they we stop that engaged. collective success, I individual mean, we can, convenience? You could talk stuff. about HR speak and sort of the, you know, kumbaya. Come it's, to, it's not HR speak. You know, it's like that Kool-Aid, drink the Kool-Aid, you, you're, part of, a, you're okay. part of more than just a company. You know, Are people buying that anymore in Silicon Valley? Does that mean anything? Will we see a complete culture shift because it's been a harsh reality after buying up uh, and basically uh, adding a ton of staff, putting ping pong tables in and having booze at 4 p.m. and yoga sessions. Look, I, I think that it's a it's a well-taken point. The bigger picture here, Wall Street's been seeing this and that they've been not saying it with the same kind of kombucha message, which is, you know, we need you back in the office. We're much better with that. That company fired 20% of the workforce. But that's exactly it. I mean, they, they're basically, they're firing the workforce and then they're saying, we're still going to hold to this sort of, you know, very touchy-feely kind of message. you year-end at the drinks and sing Kumbaya and how you've drunk the Kool-Aid and you think the culture's so important with family. You know, and then all your mates get laid off. <laughs> Look, I, I, I hear you. Give me a break. I hear you. Will this be a big culture shift? But at the same time, it is a pivot point to come back to the office. Do you know why I'd go back more. to the office? Job insecurity. Nothing. But that's exactly it. But what that's, they can't say the that. Come back to the office or it's we're going to fire you. Because we're friends. a family and we need to be together. Stop it. <laughs> it's just positive. Two <laughs> How do you really feel? I'll tell you. Uh, evidently you will. From New York. You just did. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Three hours away from the opening ballot, equity futures looking a little something like this on the S&P 500, positive a quarter of 1%, on the Nasdaq 100, up a half of 1%. Big day of losses yesterday, biggest one-day loss on the S&P going back to early November, November 9th to be precise. Treasuries yesterday, twos versus tens, negative 81 basis points at the lows, just unreal. You've got to go back to the 1980s, I believe, to see the, the curve that inverted. More inversion this morning. Yields down by another two basis points on a 10-year. 376, 365.71 rather on a 10-year, on a two-year. 442.99. There is a bid in the bond market over in Europe as well. Downside surprise for CPI in Spain. Likely to see the same thing from Germany in about 90 minutes from now. So look out for the single currency. Euro dollar shaping up as follows. Going into all of that, Euro dollar 103.73. Brahma, Euro dollar positive a third of 1%. Yeah, interesting to see how the dollar has really been uh, the weakest player overnight and over uh, the past couple of weeks. I want to bring you this. Stephen Major just put out his major bond letter where he puts out his outlook. First of all, he just said the early stages of this year's World Cup remind us that football is a funny old game, so we can just start there. But he also didn't try to project what's going to happen. It was a range of outcomes, and how much are we really going to see that as we look at uh, such different kinds of scenarios, whether it's China, whether it's energy, whether it's uh, what's going to happen in terms of supply chain disruptions. How do you read that quickly? I just got the same note. The only thing I read was what the bond market can learn from the World Cup. <laughs> Have you read that note that quickly? Well, I was looking at the 5% yield uh, scenario and that the 10-year yield could go to 5%. Uh, that seems unlikely, but it also seemed unlikely that Saudi Arabia would beat Argentina. And then you're looking down. You yeah, so he was talking about 3% being most likely and what the scenarios would be. What I find most interesting about this is his thinking process. He's always been so smart and spot on because he isn't necessarily saying this is what I think is going to happen. He's going to game out the potential... Uh, uh, scenarios and how that could play out and give you some sort of probability. You know how you joked about me talking about what I actually want to talk about? 
Yeah. Do you think that's Steve writing about what he actually wants to talk about, which is the World Cup and, and maybe not the bond market? It's literally every note that I've gotten is trying to draw analogies to the World Cup, which is what they're actually watching. And then they come up with a range of possibilities saying, we don't know what's going to happen in markets. So let's go back to Big soccer. game a little bit later, 2 p.m. Yeah. Eastern time. U.S. Look, are you going to watch that? Yeah, I am. Good. I love that. I actually am into you have this. No, do you know how happy that makes me? Oh, well, I actually am genuinely happy. doing it. I'm not just doing it to no, make I, you happy. I, no, I, you you know, never I, do anything just to make me happy. <laughs> I, I really yeah. wouldn't. <laughs> You know that, jo but that's okay. Joanne Feeney wouldn't either. <laughs> she joins us now, Portfolio Manager at Advisors Capital Management. Joanne, can we start with the tech names? Because they've been hammered this year. I'm thinking of Meta. I'm thinking of Amazon for that matter as well. When do you start to think about picking up the pieces here? Oh, well, good morning, John, Lisa. Uh, you know, clearly the, the higher interest rates, you know, has reduced valuations across the board for anything that has uh, substantial growth in it. But also there's fear of that recession, uh, earnings numbers coming down. You know, you look at it uh, relative to uh, not just history, but what they have in front of them. And some of those tech companies are better positioned than others. They have bigger, deeper moats. Uh, they have stronger, more secular growth in their end markets. You know, a company like Amazon, Microsoft, you know, we like those because the Internet is not going to stop growing. The use of data is only going to get larger, uh, more pipes, more data handling, more analytics. And so these companies, uh, we think, are still really well positioned. They've, they've gotten a lot cheaper and the growth outlook in front of them, three years, five years, 10 years, substantial growth ahead. And we think that you know, as interest rate increases start to peter out, not necessarily reverse, uh, the, the headwinds that have caused those valuations to come down over the last year, uh, those headwinds are gonna evaporate. And, and eventually they're gonna you know, turn into tailwinds as rates do come down. And we don't know when that starts, but we do uh, think that the headwinds now are really uh, diminishing and, and that makes it a particularly good time potentially to start building positions in these tech names. And if you're a long-term investor, I think you're going to be pretty happy uh, after a few years if you get into those now. Can we talk about them as a monolith or is it really company by company? Oh, definitely, Lisa, company by company. You know, the moat that, say, an Amazon and a Microsoft have relative to, you know, a Meta or a Netflix, I think is a lot deeper. You know, the network effects are stronger, the growth ahead of them because of the need for more data, more analytics, I think it's just much stronger for uh, an Amazon Web Services and a Microsoft and a Google uh, Cloud than it would be for more consumer-oriented tech companies like uh, Netflix, for example. Well, Joanne, overnight, we've been really focused on, the, on what's been going on in China, and we've been trying to play out what that means for supply chains, the disruptions for the iPhone Pro, how much this really bleeds out into structural changes in terms of whether it's reshoring or just sort of moving some production away. As an investor, do you care, or is this just a short-term blip, and you just assume that the geopolitical headwinds are going to resolve themselves? Yeah, Lisa, no, you have to care. And I think clearly the risks have gone up for anything uh, with a supply chain that's that's rooted in China. When we can see Apple making some changes, right? They're starting to position themselves to spread their manufacturing out across the world, India, Singapore, elsewhere, and, and other companies are doing the same. So in the meantime, right, you've seen these valuations come down because of that higher risk of the supply chain. China still poses a large risk, not just to companies like Apple, but much more broadly, uh, because so much of the global economy's manufacturing takes place, at least in part, there. And so that's why you know, people are so focused on what's happening with the zero COVID policy and the protests and when this all might ease up. So keeping an eye on China, keeping an eye on the Fed, I think really helps investors assess the risk and make sure they're diversified across it. You know, if you're a retired person, you're income oriented, there are ways to avoid that kind of a risk and try to carry through this volatility with more income-oriented stocks. We've had a year of massive rate hikes, that's for sure. We've also had a year where banks haven't really performed in line with that. JP Morgan year-to-date down 15%, Citigroup down more than 20 Bank of America down 17 percentage points. Joanne, what's the thesis now around the banks, and what's the argument to buy the banks going into potentially a recession and with the yield curve this inverted? Yeah, you know, John, the, the, the banks, you know, clearly are benefiting from those higher rates. Uh, on the other hand, their capital markets business, IPOs, M&A, and other places where they get fees, that part of the business is really suffering. And, and so that's why we've seen these valuations come in. Now, as long as interest rates remain elevated for an extended period, which we expect they're going to do, banks are going to, you know, enjoy higher net interest margins, and that's going to certainly feed down to the bottom line. The valuation reduction really comes from the capital market side that's that's you know that's shrunk, 
going forward into a recession, potentially a recession, you know, the chances that uh, loans uh, volume comes down a little bit. But investors, you know, are forward looking right now. You know, if there is a recession, it doesn't look like it'll be a particularly deep one, given strengths in other areas of the economy, given the low real price of energy, for example. And so, you know, it looks like we're sort of at the almost the worst moment when the probability of recession is the highest. And then, you know, you look beyond the recession and banks become an awfully good place to be, given those an interest margin is likely to stay higher for longer. Such a crazy moment in this market, Lisa. I was talking about this with Greg Staples at DWS yesterday. We're both discounting a recession and the recovery to that recession in markets, yet we haven't had the recession at all yet. It's kind of a bizarre situation, isn't it? Which is why people are saying, don't get ahead of your skis. We haven't seen the pain yet. You can't price it out. You can't factor it out. But, John, at what point do we understand what to even begin to? And this is the reason why I was talking about uh, Stephen Major, just because the range of outcomes, how do you account for probabilities and scenarios that seem to offer opposite kinds of results. Savita Subramanian with Bank of America wrote this in her outlook for 2023. The market is hoping for a Fed pivot, but it really shouldn't. A Fed easing cycle amid tightening credit conditions, i.e. recession, has been the worst backdrop for stocks. Joanne, can we finish there? Can you speak to that? Your thoughts on that comment from Savita over at B of A? Yeah, I mean, I think our, our view is that the Fed's going to have to raise rates at least a couple times more and look for, you know, 5 percent top, something like that. And then they're going to hold there for a while because it's going to take a long time for these rate increases to feed through to reduce those inflation pressures, those long and variable lags, right? Nobody knows how long and how variable. And so, yeah, the, the chances are, right, economic activity slows down. We know that earnings numbers are going to come down. Uh, on the other hand, as you guys were just discussing, you know, investors uh, should be in it for the longer term. Recessions are always temporary. Uh, and so when you look at around the market, the broad market isn't particularly cheap, but there are an awful lot of stocks that have become cheap. And so this is an opportunity to get some uh, stocks into the portfolio, some of which are even trading you know, in the single digits that are really solid companies with solid balance sheets, but and Joanne, some of them even provide income. Before we let you go, a lot of people would push back against what you're saying. And this is a new regime, they would say, where we're not seeing zero rates anymore. We're not seeing free money. We're seeing QT that's potentially going to accelerate. Can we rely on past history to dictate future results of five years actually being a good investment if we are in a new regime change? Yeah, Lisa, that's a really good point. In fact, we caution people not to use history as too much of a guide because this situation is really quite different. That one of the biggest problems the U.S. economy faces that, that is a longer term threat is a labor shortage. And whether that's because of lower birth rates, whether that's lack of immigration, legal and illegal, it does create a different environment. But when you look at what drives economic growth and therefore right, companies' ability to sell and generate earnings, those growth engines, besides the labor shortage, are still in place. Innovation, productivity has been uh, low growth recently. But when you look at the, uh, the inputs to growth, whether it's you know, computing, robotics, healthcare advances, all of those things are still progressing in the U.S. economy. So even though on the monetary side we're in a tough spot with this high inflation and rising interest rates to combat it, you know, overall the underlying fundamentals of the U.S. economy are pretty strong. And so that's why, you know, it gives us uh, confidence that the five-year investment plan is still a really good target to think of as you're planning your portfolio and your, your ultimate, you know, retirement plans, that sort of thing. Joanne, wonderful to hear from you, as always. Joanne Finney there of Advisors Capital Management, looking ahead to 2023. Just looking at the ECFC function on the Bloomberg Terminal, which just gives you a snapshot of the estimates for growth in various countries. And I've picked out America for 2023. In that survey of ours, Lisa, 0.4% is the forecast for GDP next year, just 0.4%. Will it even be that? I mean, that's what a lot of people are wondering. That's if part we get of the recession. conversation for sure. Exactly. But it's definitely, and it's global too. I mean, you're seeing this around the world, and this has to do with China. This has to do with a lot of things that also are very uncertain. But David Rosenberg is on growth. Looking forward to that conversation with him a little bit later. He's got a lot to say about how quickly inflation might fall as well. The chief strategist and economist at Rosenberg Research, coming up at 7.30 Eastern Time. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. 
President Biden and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi are moving forward to prevent a strike that would shut down the nation's freight railroads. The House is preparing to take up legislation to impose a labor settlement, despite the objections of some unions. A rail strike could hurt the economy by crippling supply chains. OPEC and its allies are expected to consider deeper output cuts when they meet this weekend. Saudi Arabia and partners surprised traders when they announced a 2 million barrel a day cutback last month. Still, prices have faltered since then as demand weakens. European Union talks on a price cap on Russian oil exports remain stuck. A cap of as low as $62 a barrel has been discussed. Poland and Baltic states say the price level is too high, but shipping nations like Greece and Cyprus want it higher. The price cap is designed to keep Russian oil flowing, while at the same time limiting Moscow's revenues. Former Vice President Mike Pence is calling on Donald Trump to apologize for having dinner with a white nationalist. In a TV interview, Pence said the former president showed profoundly poor judgment. Last week, he dined at his Mar-a-Lago resort with rapper Ye and white supremacist Nick Fuentes. Billionaire Elon Musk is publicly attacking Apple in a battle that pits the owner of Twitter against one of the company's top advertisers. Musk says that Apple has cut its Twitter advertising and threatened to block the social network from its app store. He also accused Apple of hating free speech. No comment yet from Apple. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. certainly possible that the, the zero COVID ends early and that would, would be a game changer. But it's just as possible that the clampdown comes, um, uncertainty uh, stays, supply line problems you know, rebuild, uh, and it just causes more economic slowdown out there. Great to catch up with Brian Weinstein there, the Morgan Stanley Investment Management Head of Fixed Income. Live from New York with equity futures just about positive on the S&P 500, up two-tenths of a 1%. Equities pushing higher, bond yield to lower by a couple of basis points, 365.71 on a US 10-year. Euro dollar 103.75. In about an hour and 10 minutes, you'll get CPI data out of Germany. We've had the regional breakdown so far. Downside surprise after downside surprise across Europe this morning on inflation. So that's worth a look. Just about hanging on to the 70s on WTI crude, 79.17. Call it 79.20 with positive 2.5% on crude this morning. Tweet of the morning so far. So what did China announce today? Or are we using markets to imply that something was announced? It's a good question. They did indicate that they were willing to uh, increase some of the motivation to get the vaccines. And that seems to have generated some encouragement. Perhaps also we're not seeing as many protests because they were all cracked down upon. And a current joined us now, Bloomberg Chief Asia Economics Correspondent. And what has been announced? in China overnight? Well, they're getting to the Achilles heel that we've talked about in your show so many times. They came out today and said, we are going to boost vaccination rates, especially among the elderly across China. Now, they said they're going to target nursing homes. They said they're going to use big data to try and get to those people who have not been vaccinated or in short of boosters. The, the coverage of boosters and indeed vaccinations over the age of 80 is really not where it needs to be. It's about, in fact, for those over 60, it's about 70% total coverage. Now, so that was a big announcement. But what they did not come out and announce were specific measures like enforced mandates or other kind of, uh, you know, carrot type approaches to get people to go out there and get the vaccine. There has been some reticence among the elderly in China, according to our reporting, for example, there, you know, fears of side effects. Uh, there's been a, a, a view, some could call it rational, that there was no need to get vaccinated when there was no COVID in the country. Obviously, that situation has changed, and it does feel like it's reaching a point now where, where China is, A, realising it has to get its vaccination rate where it needs to be, and B, they're starting now the first steps of what's probably going to be a very complicated journey to try and prepare the country to reopen the economy and link it up with the rest of the world. Is it fair, Enda, to think that this is preparation for an earlier exit to COVID-0 than perhaps was previously signalled? We So... I mean, it's a fair question to ask, Lisa. We just don't know for sure. What we do know is the authorities came out with that 20-point plan a few weeks ago. They are, you know, basically uh, crawling their way along this process to try and ease up restrictions where they can, but also try and control the virus, which, of course, is a very difficult thing to do. We know the economy needs to be allowed to get back on its feet, so they have to try and somehow pull out of this 
COVID zero uh, approach the way they are. But what we do know is, as a matter of fact, China is at risk of a, of a serious public health disaster that continues to be a major constraint for them, but they don't yet have the hospital network ready to deal with the kind of outbreak that experts talk about. They don't yet have the vaccination rate where it needs to be. There has been criticism, of course, that they need to embrace other kind of vaccines from the Western world as well. There's a lot that China needs to do to offset a public health disaster. So I think most people watching this today are saying this could be the beginning of the end, as, as one analyst described it. But it's probably going to be a pretty complicated road from here, I think. And uh, we think about some of the protests overnight being squashed uh, by the authorities today. We've heard about that. That doesn't seem to be the motivation of Xi Jinping's party. Right now, we're looking at companies, including Volkswagen, that are removing some of their factories or taking them offline in China because of some of the supply chain kinks, some of the issues with supplying uh, those factories. We're also hearing the U.S. push European allies to take a harder stance on China. How much is that factoring into to the speed in which uh, China would like to move away from this policy? You would have to assume it's part of their rationing, their thinking on this, Lisa. Uh, multinational corporation sentiment towards China is very negative right now. The chambers of commerce routinely come out and criticize China's COVID zero policy, or at least at the very least, they ask, what is the roadmap out of this? That's very unusual to hear these kind of commentary from the European chambers and the, and the US chambers. And you're right, supply chains are being disrupted. We saw that recently, of course, with Apple. And there certainly has been some dislocation of the supply chain out of China into neighboring countries. So when you consider the, the optics and the negative sentiment towards China, and when you consider the downward pressure on the economy, one would assume the policymakers, of course, don't want to lose that foreign investment. They don't want to lose those foreign companies and all the big employment that go with that. Uh, and it, it has to be a factor in their thinking. It's all part of getting the economy back on its feet. And the consumer base in China is incredibly powerful. And I think we forget that sometimes when we have these discussions. Can you tell me how they could respond to, say, a company like Apple, relocating its production base. Do you see that kind of nationalism underpinning consumer decisions? Well, in the past, certainly there has been nationalism in terms of uh, unofficial boycotts of chain stores or products from other countries, whether it was because something was deemed to be um, offensive to the Chinese people or whether it was because of a geopolitical spat. For one reason or another, there have been uh, you know, trade has been weaponized at times by China in an unofficial way. So you cannot rule out that if a company wants to pull out of China on a broad scale, that there wouldn't be some kind of retribution. But this is where it gets complicated, John, because some of these very large multinationals, when you speak to them, they will complain about COVID zero. But on the other hand, they will tell you, well, where else do you go that offers the scale and the scale of infrastructure that China offers where you can plug in and get up and running? There aren't many countries around the world that offer that right now. That's one of China's key defenses. Uh, the other side of the consumer story, don't forget, it isn't just COVID. It's the real estate slump. That's still one quarter of the overall economic output. That's a big part of what's happening too. Yeah, well said, Ender. Appreciate that final comment there. Ender Curran there of Bloomberg out of Hong Kong. And Lisa, we need to talk about that as well. It's not just been a COVID zero story that's dragged down growth in China. But how much has to do with the fact that people don't have the income in the same kind of way, don't necessarily sure. have some of the enthusiasm? That said, this does come with a time of tightening, right? This was a, a nation that was trying to remove some of the liquidity that really built up and generated some of the growth that really drove the world economy. They've been retrenching, moving away from that a little bit in the face of some of the uh, slowdown that we've seen recently. But Right. This is a country that in a massive uh, inflection point in a lot of different ways. And how do they navigate out of COVID zero and keep companies there that are having a really hard time? Growth in China, eight handle last year. This year, just about holding on to three. Three point three percent is the estimate for 22. Can it get back up next year? I mean, this is the one consensus in a lot of different outlooks has been China will be the bright spot next year because it's got to get better than this year. How quickly can it do that, especially if Enda's uh, correct, and I'm sure he is, that it's going to be a very difficult road? And keeping companies is going to be tough. The estimate companies. in our survey is 4.9 percent. Of course, this all hinges on year? what happens with, yeah, for next year, for 23. There's a massive asterisk next to that number, and it basically comes down to what they will or won't do with COVID zero. Okay, I'm going to be sort of delicate, but not really. Right. But do what you want. I mean, do you think that people 
are really honest in their assessment of what's going to happen next year? Do you think it's kind of clouded? Let's be optimistic so that we can sort of preserve face in a nation that's going to penalize us for being Is too negative. Is the South Side compromised saying, when it comes to analysis around China? I mean, we've heard that from... I've heard that from a million people. A ton of people. Over the last 10 years, sure. That we never see the actual uh, figures. Will that change? Because this is an administration that's actually putting out some real figures or closer to real figures. Maybe? I don't know. I, I just, th there has to be an asterisk around it. There does. And there always is. Coming up in the next hour, 7.45 Eastern, Bill Dudley, the former New York Fed president and Bloomberg opinion columnist from New York. This is Bloomberg. Yield curve, the labor market, and risk assets are all saying very different things at the moment. We're all subject to the data. Inflation is what the Fed's going to focus on. It's hard to see inflation pressures easing off completely. I don't think we're going to see inflation neatly fitting back into this 2% box anytime soon. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Yield curve, the labor market, and risk assets are all saying very different things at the moment. We're all subject to the data. Inflation is what the Fed's going to focus on. It's hard to see inflation pressures easing off completely. I don't think we're going to see inflation neatly fitting back into this 2% box anytime soon. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Lots of World Cup talk coming up. <laughs> Really? Yeah, yeah no, that's the, the promo. Show. That's, really? how, we're starting, that's okay. how we're starting the show. Okay. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning for our audience worldwide on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Equity futures up by about a third of 1%. I think we can call this some kind of a bounce back, but only a marginal one off the back of the news in China over the weekend. And did we really get a big announcement from the Chinese authorities overnight? There's going to be a push. It's a vow to make a push towards vaccinating more people. It's a nod to the biggest question mark that a lot of people have had, which is how do you prepare your population for uh, the end of COVID zero? This is the first steps to it. What that means in terms of expediting some sort of exit of COVID zero, eh, we have no idea. Massive consequences for 2023. Yes. A huge. And I don't even think we can really have a conversation about the outlook for 2023 without that conversation. The other piece of it, of course, is the Federal Reserve waiting for Chairman Powell tomorrow, waiting for the data as well, going into Friday. Does anything that Fed officials say really matter? We heard hawkish talk after hawkish talk over the past 24 hours. Bullard, Mester, name your Fed official that spoke, which is pretty much all of them. And they all say the same thing, which is we might slow the pace, but we're still going to go to a higher terminal rate. We're going to keep it there for the duration of 2023. John Williams saying this, too, of the New York Fed. And yet we're still seeing uh, rate cuts priced into this market because the market is looking past what the Fed is looking at. The market is looking past what the data is showing and is going to that faith, that stealth faith, that transitory for inflation. Binky Chara Deutsche Bank had a really interesting note in the last week, and he discussed this on this program a number of weeks ago. Can you blame higher rates? He said this, equities are where they were 175 basis points ago in rates. The S&P 500 has been at recent levels four times over the last five months, while rates have been successfully and notably higher each time, with the two-year yield up 175 basis points from the first time, suggesting it is not higher rates that drove the equity sell-off. What do you make of that? Uh, that's what I'm, I mean. I think that it's it's there is an argument that it is not the rate picture; it's the growth picture. And until it really affects how companies operate, it's not going to have material effect on stock valuations. I don't buy it because I think that, and I'll, I'll be honest, I don't buy it, and that's the reason why I kind of grunted. But you have to think about the relative valuation proposition. There are people who are suddenly saying, what, Terra? There are sure. relative alternatives or whatever. I just love that you felt the need to tell us you don't buy it, as if we didn't already know based on that pause <laughs> well, and that noise yeah, you made. I mean, come on. You, you're the one that was saying, you know, I'll tell you what I think in the break. I think that you tell us on, on air quite often. That's the sanitized <laughs> version. <laughs> yeah, and otherwise it's just a slew of expletives. I do think, though, that, you know, there is a point being made here, which is we have not seen the effect of rates where they are the way that many people thought previously. I want to do a podcast where you can curse. You know, you can curse about markets and people can just really say about how they feel 
about I think a lot things. of people are listening. I think a lot Cathartic, of people are listening. wouldn't yeah. it? I agree. Future's positive a third of 1%. <laughs> no one here at Bloomberg's going markets. for that. Or, or well, about life if you yeah, want exactly. as well. Exactly, there you go. Equities <laughs> up by a third of 1%. Yields look like this, down three basis points, 365.34 on a 10-year. Look out for German CPI coming up in about 57 minutes from now. Had a downside surprise out of Spain and looking at the regional breakdown of Germany. Pretty soft inflation prints relative, I stress relative to the previous month, though in absolute terms still elevating and something the ECB will be concerned about. Euro dollar Lisa right now, 103.83. Yeah, I'm looking right now at a 10-year German uh, yields that is sharply lower, 1.88%. And this really does speak to the downside surprise that we may be expecting in less than an hour's time. 8 a.m. we get that Germany inflation read for the month of November. How much does it matter how much it comes off if it really is due to energy, given the volatility underpinning this? I'm more curious to hear the analysis of the other drivers of employment, of other uh, consumer goods goods of wheat in other uh, areas, that might be more telling in terms of more protracted inflation. 9 a.m., we get housing data. I'm not allowed to say the name of this no, one because can. it's too long. Okay, By all means, here. say the name. There I we just go. think it needs a rebrand. And you can just do like a sort of underpinning of a, a beat of, of expletives. S&P CoreLogic case chill our 20-city home price <laughs> index for the month of September. How much does it roll over? You're right. It needs a rebrand. The S&P 20-city data set is going to come in and can we see a real rolling over of house values or is this just a softening in the pace of how quickly they're going up we are looking for some sort of disinflationary kind of feel and potentially even deflation. At 11.30 a.m., I think this is going to be interesting, a news conference from Jens Stoltenberg of NATO. He's going to be talking about Ukraine and ongoing support, but also China. And we're seeing a lot of pushback from U.S. saying, look, European allies, we have to have a cohesive energy and a cohesive uh, strategy when it comes to dealing with China. Lisa, thank you. Looking forward to that. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say, is Evan Brown, head of multi-asset strategy at UBS Asset Management. Evan, always fantastic to catch up with you and the team. Let's just start with the core theme for you guys, which is that you think investors are going to be surprised by how resilient this U.S. economy will continue to be, perhaps deep into 2023. Evan, can you walk us through the why and for how long you think we might be surprised? Yeah, so I, I, I think the, for one, we're in an environment where you still have a lot of excess savings on household balance sheets in aggregate. So we know that those excess savings are, are dwindling somewhat for some of the lower earners, but the biggest spenders in the economy are higher earners. You still have a very tight labor market for those lower earners, lower income earners. Um, plus, and I think this is a very big deal, a big decline in gasoline prices. That's going to be a, a, a big support for the U.S. consumer. You've got a Social Security adjustment, cost of living adjustment that's going to uh, effectively boost incomes. The, the states uh, have a lot of excess savings themselves, and there's direct support for uh, consumers coming coming through there. So, uh, so what we're talking about is a reasonably healthy economy despite all the rate hikes that we've seen today. Can you be just as constructive on earnings? Yeah, I mean, I think as inflation comes down, that's going to weigh somewhat on on earnings. But I think a lot of that is known, right? A lot of that, even if you haven't seen analyst expectations come down as much, everyone's talking about recession. Everyone's talking about earnings coming down. And so the surprise is that they hang in there, right? We're not talking about a boom in earnings. They're definitely coming down. But we are talking about them just kind of hanging in. And at this point, that's probably enough. Do you think we could see the uh, outcome for 2023 flipped from what people are expecting, which is a good first half and a really bad second half? It could be, because I, I do think that the the tightness of the labor market can continue, and that's going to keep the Fed on edge. There's a lot of narrative right now that, OK, the Fed's going to do another 50 basis point hike, another 25 basis point hike and more or less be be done. But if the labor market is staying tight, then there's a bias that the, the Fed has to, you know, kind of extend to do a more a few more 25 basis points hike. Can we get to a five and a half, six percent expected terminal rate? I think we can. And ultimately, you know, that can be the thing that makes the economy crack down the road, but it's too early to trade that right now. What does that mean in terms of the bond trade, given that so many people hid out in the long end? Does that mean that that could be fine for now and we could see that work for another couple months? But if we go to a 5 to 6% benchmark Fed funds rate, 
all of a sudden that trade gets blown up. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I mean, I, I do think a lot of the bond rally is is a result of uh, people kind of short covering. Everyone's been short bonds for a long time, uh, and I think a lot of it too has been the round trip that we've seen from from the UK transitioning from fiscal stimulus coming from the Trust administration to now Sunak and and fiscal austerity. So that's putting downward pressure globally on on yields, but uh, all of that is kind of played out and now and now we get to the point where you know growth is okay inflation is sticky fed might be doing more than people expect and then right out there you have the bank of the japan right which which at some point next year probably in the first half is going to be adjusting and even if that's kind of known i that's really that last anchor that there is on bond yield so i think almost even psychologically that's going to be uh, injecting some term premium in, in bond markets and perhaps leading to um a renewed sell-off in, uh, in duration. Evan, if that's the case, where does that leave the dollar trade? Because I'd pick up on cable, you mentioned the UK, that went from 103.50 intraday lows of the year on September 26th to 120 right now. Similarly, we've had a turnaround in euro dollar as well. Evan, are you saying that dollar strength can kick back in too? Yeah, I think it'll it'll kick back in, but um, not to the same extent that that we've seen for the bulk of this year. And the reason being that Europe, you know, the, the, we all know that they're in recession or about to be in recession. They're going to be bouncing back. In fact, you're already seeing the confidence measure, consumer confidence, business confidence measure stabilize and in some cases turn. So you, you should get on a forward looking basis a little bit of bounce from, from Europe. You know, China, the path is bumpy, bumpy uh, leaving zero COVID, but uh, the destination is reopening. I mean, they're going to have to reopen in order to make sure that the economy uh, just doesn't completely fall apart and that that the government has the tax revenues to actually uh, kind of uh, pursue their policies on on commerce prosperity and redistribution and and the like. So the the current situation is unsustainable in China. And so we'll pick pick up there. So if you're getting, you know, more support from Europe, more support from China, uh, it's not just a U.S. driven economic story. Evan, final forecast we want from you, Team USA against Iran, 2 p.m. Eastern time. What's the score? The U.S. is going to win 2-1. That's, uh, you can count on that. There we go. <laughs> there we go. UBS, you see, UBS likes to play ball. What was PIMCO about earlier? You know, baseball they play, chat. Play, they're playing a different ball. Baseball banter. Yeah, I what's mean... That? I st- well, OK, what's your projection? What's your prediction for the game? Well, I'll tell you what I hope. I, I hope Team USA progresses. No, I mean, the, 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 the score. And, and I'll Come go on. with Evan Brands 2 1. You're ba- you think you're going to go with that? I'll go with Evan Brands 2 1. Sure. I'm going to do 3 1. 3 1. Nice. Okay. okay. Yeah. Good. You want to put money on it? I, if you want to. <laughs> I mean, does, does the money go to charity? I don't like to gamble. No, I know. I don't either. I, I, I don't Have gamble. Have you ever done at a all. slot machine? Someone once paid me to do a slot no, machine. It was I would not never satisfying. Do, I did horses back in the day. Really? Yeah, sure. I can see you get, and, you do, and you do, you know, Formula One, no? I don't gamble on it. You know. Right. Used to bet on some horses. Really? Sure. How much money did you lose? <laughs> <laughs> I don't gamble anymore. All right. Bill Dudley joining us in about 30 minutes' time. Looking forward to it. Live from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Federal Reserve policymakers are stressing that more interest rate hikes are on the way to curb inflation. New York Fed President John Williams told reporters that he sees rates heading somewhat higher than he had forecast just a few months ago. Meanwhile, St. Louis Fed President James Bullard says that markets are underpricing the chance of higher rates. China plans to increase COVID vaccinations among its senior citizens. It's a step that health experts regard as crucial to reopening an economy stuck in harsh COVID zero restrictions. Still, Beijing stopped short of announcing mandates that helped raise inoculation rates in other countries. The move comes after a weekend of protests demanding an end to COVID limits. HSBC has agreed to sell its Canadian unit to Royal Bank of Canada. The price, $10 billion in cash. The deal will allow RBC to expand its roster of business clients and bulk up its retail presence on the West Coast. The transaction represents a rare domestic acquisition for one of Canada's big banks. 
And in New York, the Transportation Authority may have to raise fares or reduce service on subways, buses, and commuter trains. According to State Comptroller Thomas Napoli, the agency's current financial plans are insufficient to close long-term budget gaps. Weekly ridership around 60 percent of pre-pandemic levels, and the transit agency faces a $500 million deficit in 2025. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. This is a critical time for our security, and we are sending an important message. NATO is here, NATO is vigilant, and NATO is ready to defend every inch of allied territory. Ian Stoltenberg there, the NATO Secretary General, live from New York this Tuesday morning. Good morning to you all. Equity futures are just about positive, up a third of 1%. Yields are coming in just a little bit on a 10-year, down two basis points, 365.71. I'll talk more about the European bond market a little bit later this morning off the back of a downside surprise on Spanish CPI. Euro dollar at the moment 103.74 with down about a third of 1%, up a third of 1% rather on that currency pair. The euro showing just a little bit of strength. Lisa, you mentioned a news conference coming up with Jens Stoltenberg. What time was that? 11.30 a.m. 11.30. What yeah. are we expecting from it? I'm curious to hear not just what they're going to do in order to provide Ukraine with support, but also with respect to China and how the West is trying to reduce reliance on China, because we've heard that much more uh, clearly spoken over the past couple of weeks. And let's get you some team coverage. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Anne-Marie down in Washington, D.C., together with Maria Tadeo over in Bucharest. Maria, let's begin with you. What are you expecting from the NATO Secretary General a little bit later? Well, Jonathan, I already had a preview because I was at a panel in which he assisted and spoke, and there were two things that he repeated time and time and again. One, NATO is the biggest military alliance. Perhaps that is a message not just to Russia, but also China. He also appealed to allies for a full comprehensive package of assistance for Ukraine. And right now, this is not just money and weapons, but also winter equipment. This country is already under a lot of pressure uh, because of the low temperatures. And then something that that to me really, really caught my eye and he suggested, well, we should learn the lessons from Russia and perhaps apply them to other autocracies like China. We should reduce our dependencies from countries that clearly do not share the same values. Well, and, and Maria Tadeo, this is really an issue, especially as you hear Volkswagen pulling back and actually closing down some of their factories in Russia, saying it's because of supply chain constraints, because of materials that they cannot get. Is this a stealth way, a good excuse for certain industrial companies from the West to withdraw from China. Is that what we're actually seeing? Look, it is hard to tell because on the flip side, there was also the German chancellor who went over to China a few weeks ago with a bunch of CEOs also again on that trip, official visit. But there is also right now in Germany a rethinking about essentially what was our foreign policy for decades. And that is that the more you trade, the better relationships that you have and therefore diplomatic ties will improve with Russia, that entire playbook that Angela Merkel applied for years have gone out the window. They did a lot of trade with Russia, they got burned, and now you have a war. So I think with uh, China, with respects to Germany, there are tensions within the coalition, how to treat uh, the Chinese, but also overall in Europe, there's this idea that perhaps, yes, you have to decouple from countries that do not share your values or at least not be as dependent to not be in a situation like the one we're in right now, in a perfect storm, high energy costs, still dependent on Russian supplies, a massive diplomatic fight over the oil and gas cap, and of course, inflation still being a problem. Anne-Marie, how united is the West when it comes to moving away from China, moving away from Russia? Well, I think Maria really speaks to the tension that you see. On one hand, you do see companies and you do see the West wanting to diverge and divest away from China. You see that with Apple moving some stuff to India. You see that with the U.S. Try trying to drum up 
support at home when it comes to chip manufacturing. But at the same time, you have Chancellor of, of Germany, Olaf Scholz, going over to Beijing recently to make sure that those economic ties, and by the way, he was flanked by all the most important German executives in their companies like VW, et cetera. Um, and then you have Emmanuel Macron also heading himself to China. So there's this issue where they're dealing with the economies that they are dealt with. This was, as Maria said, this is what Chancellor Merkel really had for years. The Germans really rely on China when it comes to their economy, the same way they relied on cheap Russian gas when it comes to their manufacturing. This is something that is going to take years to unwind, but you do see the start of it. But at the same time, it's not just going to be like switching off a light switch. MH, how do you think this is going to play out between Macron and Biden later this week? Well, when it comes to Macron and Biden and this state visit, what is really going to be on the agenda is what Macron has recently called the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act and those climate subsidies that they're giving to U.S. companies only. He said that these are unfriendly practices. And he says that they're calling this protectionism. And this is something that the Europeans, really behind the scenes, want to work out the United States. But also to show a little bit of a fractured environment in Europe, Europe you have the Germans who are saying we need to deal and communicate with the Biden administration, and we should not start an inflation trade war. So they're actually more welcoming a little bit of what the U.S. is doing, the Inflation Reduction Act, very different stance than how France has been taking it. And this will be the main topic as President uh, Macron visits Washington this week. Amory, final question. Who goes further, Team USA or Spain? <laughs> oh, oh end, gosh. Man. Maria's going to be upset with me, but no I'm kidding. obviously rooting for America. Oh, yeah, you're just trying to set Today this up. Today I'm so fired up about this. Oh, I know. That's why you're basically <laughs> just setting her up. Have you seen Maria out on Twitter? Yeah, should, uh, are we going to let fact, her speak or no? Do you think Maria needs permission? <laughs> Go ahead, Maria. The fact, <laughs> the, the fact this face. was even a question, I, I, I just cannot. I can't. I'm... See, speechless. I need a moment. Let's go to commercial. Just back to you guys. <laughs> Let's go See? to commercial. I'm just going to get That's the tension just... between, yeah. between Spain and Washington, D.C. right now. <laughs> That's not about Spain and Washington, D.C. What are you doing? All I could say is that she'd have a field day on that podcast that you're going to do where you can curse. I think that, that's, uh, I think that, that she'd uh, They would be my first guess. Yeah, Madrid. Today, Owen, AMH. I actually watched talking about the World Cup. Spain. Uh, Spain versus Germany. They, they play really nice football. They play a great game. And they are young. She's right. And they're good. They I'm are impressed. good. They are they really are good. good. Gavi was excellent. That was fun. She's very like pro Gavi. Gavi. I mean, there are others that are very good, too. I mean, it was really a great game to watch. I'm pleased you watch it. Look at the shape of Spain, the way they play football. It's really interesting. They'll always have someone on either side of the wings pinned to the sidelines. And it's the way Barcelona plays football. They really stretch out of defence. So you see Dani Olmo on the far, far side and, and Torres on the other side. And they're always there, always there in position whenever they've got possession. It's a fast passing game. I like that. And just sort of the, the idea of one team moving as as one, even though they're continually passing. It was impressive. Some people find it very boring as well, because it's just sort of like, you know. I like that. I, it's chess. Uh, Maria likes it too, clearly. Yeah, she, she has lots of things to say. Very fired up about yeah, You about knew this. this. You were just setting her no, up. No, no, I'm so shocked. Obvious. I thought she'd be more diplomatic about it. You, you thought That's that she'd be less diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you really thought. Coming up, David Rosenberg. Looking forward to that. The founder and president of Rosenberg Research. A must-watch, must-listen conversation just around the corner. Did I get to say thanks to Anne-Marie and Maria? I don't think I did. I think we should say it again. Thank you. Anne-Marie, today I... To the both of you, thank you, as always. Equity futures shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. Team Spain planned in a couple of days. We'll get Maria's thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> Just follow her on Twitter. surveillance. If she comes back, I mean, she's very unhappy off the back of those comments. <laughs> Equity's up a third of 1%. Yields down a couple of basis points, 366. She wasn't joking. Did you see her eyes? Oh, she was really angry. She's like, I can't furious. even be on this. She almost furious. ripped off her microphone. I don't even want to be on the show anymore. I basically got a break. I don't really you know? care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be on with you guys. That's basically what it was. Hey, she's not the only one, is she? <laughs> no, probably. No. So no. That's why Tom's still off. <laughs> why he basically ripped off his microphone and said, I'm not coming back. Forget it. From New York, this is Bloomberg. <laughs>
live from New York, trying to bounce here on the S&P 500 by about a third of 1%, trying to bounce back from the biggest one-day loss on the S&P, going back to November 9th, up about a quarter of 1% now on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up a half of 1%. In the bond market, deeply, deeply inverted yield curve. The two-year versus the 10-year negative. Something like 80 basis points at the moment, 443.40 on a two-year. Yields lower again on a 10-year to 366, so more curve inversion for you. And a bit abroad as well, in Europe. Firmer bond markets in Germany, in Italy, off the back of downside surprises on inflation in Spain and potentially in Germany in about 30 minutes' time. We had the regional breakdown in Germany, as we often do on CPI, a little bit earlier this morning, indicating you could get an easing of inflation in Europe as well. So your 10-year comes down 10 basis points in Germany, down 15 in Italy, and the euro, Lisa, a little bit stronger. How much is it a head fake? Is it just having to do with energy prices and can people shrug this off? Don't know is the short answer, the ECB's in a tough spot. And that's the bigger debate when the ECB convenes on December 15th. And we've talked about this a few times. Inflation's still pretty elevated in Europe. A lot of that is the energy story. It's not the same as what's taking place here in the United States. And the ECB is hiking into a downturn. And they're set to do it again in a couple of weeks' time. Maybe the debate goes away from 75 and towards 50, a little bit like the Federal Reserve off the back of this data, but still, double-digit CPI there and thereabouts. And how much, really, confidence can people give to the uh, disinflationary kind of force? How much confidence can people give to what we heard overnight in China as well in terms of emphasizing vaccinations, particularly for older uh, older residents of China? And this really has been a driving massive moves in certain Chinese ADRs that we're seeing here, including Biden. Do, as well as Alibaba. You can see those shares flying ahead of the market open up 5.5% uh, for Alibaba and Baidu is up 6.5%. And I also, those are some of the things that I'm looking at. I'm also looking at Ferrari because it is one of the main stories of the day. Those shares are down a half a percent after the resignation of team principal Mattia Binotto, who you know has been there for a long time, a real leader. I'm going to try to pretend to... Ferrari. Yeah. This is the Formula One team. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, carry, you know. carry on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly... Well, they had I a basically... disappointing year. Fantastic car. Yeah. Super fast. Mm. Terrible strategy. They should have dominated the first half of the season. You saw how many polls that Charles Leclerc got and ultimately didn't convert them into wins in the way he should have done, and certainly not like Max Verstappen did. And Red Bull were dominant again, so I'm hoping Ferrari turn it around. So you're you know glad? I, I'm happy about a couple of things when it comes really? to sport. I'm happy that we're getting more buy-in to international football. <laughs> Can you're I call it international You're football? trolling me on air. No, Go no, on. Okay. And, and I'm also really happy that we're finally getting buy-in in America to Formula One as well. That's been a huge change over the last 12 months. Slightly off the back of the Netflix series, I know. But we're going to have a number of races here on the calendar next year. I believe Vegas is coming as well. Miami, Vegas. It's, it's an easier crossover, though, Another because of NASCAR. I mean, it's uh, well, an easier... NASCAR's been a thing yeah. that's held people back from converting to Formula One. But I think that, you know, it's equal opportunity, especially after sports. I'm pleased uh, you brought that somewhat. up. That's great. I mean, I, I just, you know... Was I'm just, just trying to make you happy every day. Are you looking at day. Juventus as well or no? Just Ferrari. Let's move on. <laughs> you, you're done. <laughs> yeah, I've moved on. <laughs> You've only got 60 seconds for me to talk Formula One. Okay. <laughs> Carry on. You want to go, go. A number of weeks ago, <laughs> Patrick Harker of the Philadelphia Fed said something really interesting and Mike McKee picked up on it. He referred to inflation. He said it could go up like a rocket and down like a feather. And we've got a conversation coming up now with a man who I think disagrees with that point of view. David Rosenberg joins us, the founder and president of Rosenberg Research. David, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. I think that's where we should begin. This idea that it can go up very quickly and inflation can be much stickier on the way down. David, do you push back against that and why? Yeah, I push back on it because uh, I heard the very same things, you know, when I was at uh, Mother Merrill uh, back in the summer of 2008 uh, when we had the Chinese commodity super cycle and global decoupling and uh, inflation at that point was pressing against 6% because oil was running up to $145 a barrel. Uh, and uh, we went from 6% inflation uh, in the next year, the summer of 09, uh, we were down to negative 2% uh, year over year. And it wasn't because of services. Service sector inflation uh, is, is always sticky. Service sector pricing uh, never deflates. Um, and that's what people tend to focus on. That's what the Fed's focused on or on the rental measures, which dominate uh, the CPI. But, you know, 40% of the CPI uh, are goods. You know, the stuff you can see, touch and feel uh, that you're starting to already see the signs in the commodity markets and the lagged impact of the strong dollar are starting to create deflationary forces in that 40% chunk. 
So everybody who's hawkish on inflation looks at the rental side. And of course, everybody knows that there's lags involved in terms of how that's constructed in the CPI. But in real time, we're going to be seeing some significant deflation in that 40% of the CPI called materials. Uh, you know, so when he talks about that inflation can't come crashing down, there are already measures uh, in real time that are crashing down. I mean, oil is down, what, 35% from the peak. Copper is down 25%. Most, uh, most shipping rate measures are down roughly 60%. Uh, those were actually the factors that precipitated that rocketing up of inflation came out of the commodity markets and came out of the supply bottlenecks that had a big impact on transportation costs. Those have gone into major reverse. They, they're not falling like a feather, okay? They're, they're falling like a stone right now. And that's going to show up, I think, forcefully in the CPI data between now and 12 months from now. David, falling like a stone to what? What is the level that you see it kind of remaining sticky? Overall inflation? Uh, well, I, I don't see, I, I don't think it's going to be, well, altogether that sticky. I think that we've already peaked. Uh, when you're taking a look at some of the leading indicators, like the pipeline measures, core intermediate PPI, core crude PPI, uh, they are actually not just decelerating, they're deflating. Uh, and that's going to create downward pressures on the good side of the CPI over the course of the next year. I actually think that we will be either at or below 3% on headline CPI year over year by this time next year. People would push back pretty vociferously, including a lot of Fed officials, particularly with respect to the labor market that continues to be pretty tight and continuing to see uh, wages increase pretty significantly. How do you view that and pair that with this disinflationary view that you hold? Well, you know, what I find uh, interesting about the Fed is their uh, pre prevalent focus on lagging indicators. Uh, I mean, you mentioned wages, for example, unit you know, labor costs. Uh, they're in the conference board's index of lagging economic indicators. Wages lag the cycle. In fact, you could argue that inflation lags the cycle. It usually peaks and goes down uh, six months into the recession. Uh, the labor market is tight, but it is starting to loosen up. And the labor market is, is always tight. You always have either a three or four handle on the unemployment rate at the peak of the economic expansion. Uh, my sense is that, you know, the Fed's already told us that their forecast for next year is the unemployment rate to go to 4.4%. Uh, you know, depending on what the participation rate does, I think we're going to head up towards 6%. Um, so this is a situation, you know, where your forecast, uh, your assumptions drive your forecast. I think that we're going to get much higher unemployment rate. Uh, and with a lag, that's going to create uh, more discernible downward pressure on wages. Uh, and it's already starting to show up. When you're taking a look at some measures of compensation, yes, they're running hot uh, on a trend basis, but they've started to peak out and started to roll over at the margin. And I think that's going to be a big theme. Uh, I don't think that uh, you know the labor market today is going to be the labor market next year any more than you could tell me at the peak of the 2007 economic expansion or the peak of the 2000 economic expansion when the unemployment rate was about where it is today to, to basically superimpose that on the next 12 months in the context of recession staring us in the face. Uh, I think that these wage trends are going to be rolling over pretty significantly too. David, what do you think the market consequences will be from all of this? Well, I think that... Uh, I'm, I'm taking a look at the stock market, and look, I, I, I'm, I'm waiting to uh, shed my, you know, my bearish fur and uh, and turn bullish. But in all seriousness, you have a forward PE multiple uh, of 17 uh, heading into a recession, and uh, you have analyst earnings estimates, uh, which have started to come down in dribs and drabs. But you know, you never had a recession where earnings were positive, and the consensus, and of course, the valuations are premised the forward. P multiples are premised on forward earnings estimates. They haven't really been cut that much yet. I think that for people that are buying the stock market at a 17 multiple, on recession earnings, you're really buying the market at over a 20 multiple. And that is just too rich for me. So I still am outright, I would say, cautious, if not bearish on the stock market. And I think that the bond market's behaving extremely well here. Uh, I think the bond market is giving you a view that the Fed is already over tightened. And my sense is that uh, I would be, my, my, my strongest conviction call is the long bond for the next 12 months. I think that you will get returns there that you won't get in other asset classes. So bullish on treasuries, most detested asset class, I'm fine with that. Uh, but in a recession, um, and as it becomes more widely accepted, and inflation comes down, uh, I think treasury yields out the curve are going to be the place to be. David, what do you think the character of that recession will be? The consensus view we hear a lot, you hear it a lot listening to this programme, short and shallow, short and shallow. 
David, do you push back against that as well? Well, <laughs> you know, the thing is that the same people that were saying that uh, we're going to have the roaring 20s and there was not a recession on the horizon are now saying, oh, don't worry, it's going to be a short and shallow recession. Um, I'm not so sure about short and shallow, but frankly, I don't really care uh, because you could have forecasted a short and shallow recession uh, in 2001 and you would have been dead right because uh, GDP barely contracted. But you had overinflated asset values and you still ended up with almost a three year bear market uh, in stocks, even with that mild recession. So a mild recession is not a get out of jail free card uh, for long only risk asset managers. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we don't know um, the extent to which it's going to be mild or not mild. Here's the problem with the mild recession scenario. Mild recessions, you don't get V-shaped recoveries, at least in a sharp downward move in GDP, and you get the stimulus inevitably from the Fed, you get a V-shaped recovery. So I would ask those people, uh, thinking about equities as a long duration asset, let's say we get a mild recession. What's the recovery going to look like? And then you have the Fed telling us that not only are they talking about the funds rate being higher, the terminal rate being higher than they were talking about, you know, back in September, that now we're going to be north of 5%. And the Fed's telling you that no matter what, and remember, th their their forecast right now is 4.4% on the unemployment rate. Yeah, That would mean this cycle, we would have risen almost a full percentage point, which has never happened without a context of a recession. So they're telling you implicitly in our forecast, we have a recession. Oh, by the way, we are so retentive uh, on the inflation side that we're going to leave rates higher for longer. So even when it comes time for the Fed to cut rates like they've done in the past in the face of economic strains, this Fed's not going to do it. So, okay, let's talk about short and shallow recession. The next question is, okay, what sort of recovery are you going to see? And it says, seems to me that without short and shallow recession and a Fed not stimulating policy, uh, we're going to be bouncing along the bottom on the economy for an elongated period of time. I mean, ultimately, you're paying for growth as an equity investor. So fine, run with run with that view, short and shallow recession with no recovery, uh, because we're going to have a still tight Fed well into next year, if not beyond. And so that means that the longer term outlook for assets, for long duration assets, uh, are still going to be very challenged. And you'll be in treasuries. That's all that's going down. David, this was wonderful. We could keep this going for a long, long time, but I'm told we can't because we've got to get to a commercial break. <laughs> David Rosenberg, thank you. Absolutely fantastic. A lot to think about there, Bramo. A ton to think about. And the reason this guy wants to hang out in a 10-year is because that V-shaped recovery, if you're going to get short and shallow, ain't coming. What if it's not short and shallow? What if it's long and shallow? What if it isn't necessarily steep, but it is something that is sustained for a longer period you know, of time? Pimco, Tiffany Wilding talked about that. Yeah. She pushed back against that. And off the back of what David was talking about there as well, if you believe this Federal Reserve is not going to be cutting anytime soon, and if you believe in what they're telling us, which is they're going to keep rates elevated for a long, long time, then that should raise questions about the duration of the downturn. That's what some people are saying. And what's more negative? for risk assets, short and shallow, short and steep, or long and shallow. And that's something people are thinking about over the longer term. Bill Dudley's gonna be with us in just a moment, the former New York Fed president, looking forward to his thoughts. Coming up on Bloomberg Surveillance, live from New York, this is Bloomberg. counting the first 250 basis points as if that was a tightening of monetary policy, but really that's just getting up to the long run neutral level of the policy rate. We've only recently moved into restrictive territory and we're going to have to move farther in order to keep uh, uh, inflation under control. Jim Bullard there, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis president, live from New York City with equity futures positive, just about up two tenths of one percent on the S&P, up on the Nasdaq as well. Yields lower just a little bit by a basis point or so, 366.63 on a US 10 year. Euro stronger by two tenths of one percent, 103.62. In about 12 minutes time, you'll get inflation data out of Germany and we'll bring that to you. I'm happy to say that joining us now is Bill Dudley, the former New York Fed president and currently Bloomberg opinion columnist, and so much more. Bill, great to catch up with you, sir. I just want to reflect on something we heard about five minutes ago from David Rosenberg, pushing back against this idea that inflation will be stickier on the way down. Bill, I know you listened to some of that conversation. What did you make of it? I agree with David that uh, inflation is going to take a longer time to, to corral than people think. I mean, people are focusing so much on the improvement in goods inflation. That was well expected. 
uh, as, as the economy has opened up, the composition of demand has shifted away from goods back to services. So, of course, goods prices are going to be weaker. But services inflation is really high, and the labor market is still really tight. We're still having job gains well above what's consistent with uh, a, a loosening labor market. So the Fed's got a lot of work to do. I think the big thing about what the next uh, you know year is going to look like, it's really, uh, it's really in the Fed's control. Uh, the Fed uh, is going to keep policy tight enough for long enough to get inflation back down. And, you know, the, the, the outcome we get for the economy is going to depend on how, how, how much that actually hurts economic growth. I think there is going to be a recession. I think it's going to last uh, you know, quite a while. But it's, it's not going to be a dangerous recession in the sense that the Fed can relent at any time uh, and end that recession, which is very unusual compared to past cycles. This is not a recession that's going to be driven by, you know, uh, financial instability. It's not going to be a recession driven by, you know, uh, household and corporate balance sheets being overextended. It's a recession that's completely induced by a tight monetary policy regime. And so the Fed can end it when they think the time is right. Given the strength that we've continued to see in the economy, and Evan Brown of UBS Asset Management was talking about them seeing it sustained through the first half of next year, do you think the Fed could go even higher than you previously thought in terms of a benchmark rate? I'm thinking the peak is probably in the five to five and a half percent range, just for the, what you, for the point you just made, that the, the news will probably be stronger for longer. It'll be very hard for the Fed just to stop uh, if we're still, you know, at an unemployment rate below four percent and, you know, underlying inflation is still running, you know, four percent or higher. So I think that it will get a series of, you know, smaller rate hikes, but that will probably push us up above above five percent. But clearly the Fed's uh, strategy here is uh, they're stressing the longer rather than the ever higher. So I think once we get to you know five and a quarter, five and a half, I think they'll, they'll relent, and then, and then they'll just sit sit there and wait for that restrictive monetary policy to slow the economy down, uh, generate more slack in the labor market, and that will gradually push both wage inflation and services price inflation down. This is what Fed officials have been saying, Bill. I mean, this is basically pretty much in line with what they're saying. The market is not buying it. They are still pricing in rate cuts. By the end of next year, what does the Fed have to see to start becoming less restrictive? And I don't mean that with respect to uh, keeping rates where they are. I mean, actually lowering them in a significant way. Well, they have to be highly confident that they're going to be able to achieve their 2% inflation objective. doesn't mean that inflation has to be at 2% when they finally uh, relent, but they have to be highly confident. Now, what does highly confident mean? It means that they have to see significant uh, slack developing in the labor market that brings down wage inflation to the 3 to 4% range, uh, and they need to see uh, the inflation pressures be much, uh, uh, you know, much less persistent uh, and broad. Uh, as, as they are today. So they need to see probably inflation in the sort of 3% range headed down. Uh, and once they've, once they've accomplished both of those things, then maybe they can start to, to relent. But I think it's going to take quite some time because the economy still has a considerable forward momentum. And it's, and it's going to be sustained by, by, by the past inflation that we've seen. For example, Social Security recipients are going to get an 8.7% increase uh, in their checks come January. Uh, and they're going to go out and spend a bunch of that money, and that's going to keep the economy uh, moving along. And that's going to make it hard for the Fed to, to, to restrain things. Bill, you wrote yesterday on Bloomberg Opinion that the Fed shouldn't raise its inflation target. You said changing the objective now would be bad for the economy and for the central bank's own credibility. But I did wonder when that got published. I wondered why you wrote it. Are you really worried that they might actually go through with that next year? Well, I, I wrote it because I'm being asked about it all the time. Uh, and so I thought I should write down what I th think the right answer is. You know, the argument for raising the inflation target is really sort of two, two potential arguments. Number one, can't hit two, so let's make the, uh, the objective a little bit easier. That's, that's obviously not a very good argument. The other argument is a little bit better, which is we have a higher inflation target, then the peak in uh, short-term interest rates during the cycle will be higher and we'll have more room to ease. Uh, when, when a recession hits, and so there'll be less risk of being pinned at the zero lower bound for interest rates. I think that risk, though, has diminished considerably because the peak in short-term rates this cycle is probably going to be above 5%. So the Federal Reserve has plenty of ammunition to cut rates uh, uh, in an environment where, where their inflation target is still 2%. So I think this idea that the zero lower bound continues to be this huge risk uh, and, and, and is a big constraint on monetary policy, I think that's overstated at this point. But, Bill, how concerned are you that the Fed will not have the same resolve in the middle of next year to keep rates where they are if we do see the unemployment rate going up and we do see the U.S. entering into recession? Well, I think the committee, uh, it will be interesting to see whether the committee is united uh, you know, 12 months from now as it is today. Uh, I think Chair Powell uh, means what he says, that he, does, he wants to behave in a way 
uh, that, that he's not like Arthur Burns, so he doesn't have to be like Paul Volcker. Uh, but whether he can keep the rest of the committee along with him uh, as the unemployment rate goes up and the trade-offs between the two, two objectives of the Fed, price stability and, and maximum sustainable employment, become more in conflict with one another. So I, I think we don't know the answer to that. I'm hopeful that Powell will carry the day. I remember when inflation was sub 2% and people were talking about raising the inflation target then. Do you remember that? I do. They should raise it to 3 Absolutely. Because then they'd be more ambitious and people would believe they're committed to getting inflation higher. Then they might hit 2 Yeah. Do you remember <laughs> when they were also talking about uh, free money and uh, modern monetary theory? We uh, did that too. Crazy times. Bill Dudley, thank you. Appreciate it as always. Really thought-provoking. It always is. Bramo, the idea that if you say, let's say, I'm going to go with 3 and it's no longer 2 it's 3%. Isn't it just as hard to hit three now? Because you start to believe from an expectations perspective, if they're worried about inflation expectations, if I don't have any confidence in a central bank's commitment to a target of, say, 2%, and I'm in the market, I don't get a question whether they're really committed to three. That's Bill Dudley's point that this actually will allow inflation expectations to become unmoored. Also, that there is a benchmark price stability that's necessary for businesses to uh, be able to have reliable pricing strategies and be able to chart out uh, some sort of policy going forward. He's saying that 3% studies show that it's harder for businesses to do that. I mean, there's actual academic research behind what price stability really means uh, for a major economy. How do you think it would show up in you, Mitch? If they move to three, away from two, <laughs> and they call people up, <laughs> they'd be like, they'd oh, yeah, to that? yeah, yeah, they would respond immediately. My expectations are 100 basis points higher than they were the month before. It's been remarkably accurate in reflecting, you know. <laughs> okay, all right, you don't buy up just because you haven't been called. If, you know, University of Michigan, if you call John, he'll be more positive I'd on this particular I just survey. Want to go through so the questions with them and he'll stop, you know. Where do you think inflation will be in five years? <laughs> Well, it's been it's, it's been notably consistent in tracking market sentiment. Alicia Levine in the studio next impressive. from BMY Mellon. Looking forward to that. From New York, this is Bloomberg. The labor market justifies what the Fed's doing. The CPI is the objective. The wage numbers may become more important than CPI. The yield curve is definitely telling you a recession is, is coming. It's not here yet, but the check is certainly in the mail. It's very, very difficult for the Fed to, to land the plane here successfully. We're entering 2023 when there's just so many unanswerable questions. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together with Alicia Levine of BMY Mellon, we'll get to Alicia in just a moment. Equity futures are positive by about a third of 1% on the S&P 500. Bramo, a few key events still to go. Jolts data, jobs on Friday, and Chairman Powell tomorrow. Which do you think is most important? Chairman Powell or the data? Yeah. At the moment, I yeah. think this market's just trading on the data and not on the Fed speak. And I you've would seen agree. that with CPI, you've seen that from PPI, you've seen that from some of the recent data. And the recent Fed speaks push back against a lot of what we've seen in markets and have markets listened? Not so much. The Fed credibility to me is really in question, given that markets have completely pushed back and Fed officials come out and keep trying to jawbone this market lower and say, no, we are going to hold rates around 5 percent. We're not going to cut rates, et cetera, et cetera. And the market says we're still going to price that in. So we don't buy it. So I actually think that Jolt's data might be the most important data point of the week. If it comes in hotter than expected, more job openings than expected, how much does that shift the narrative and go for what the Fed is trying to say, but perhaps uh, isn't really communicating to the market? Great to have you with us in the studio, Alicia, your thoughts on that? What is more important, the Fed speak or the data? So, so I think it's the data, and I think it's precisely the labor data, because the Fed has explicitly targeted the labor market here. As inflation has remained higher and stickier and not transitory, they've been talking about the labor market trying to get rid of job openings, the beverage curve which is the JOLTS data, and then, of course, you know, the, the wage data. And I think if you don't see softness in either of those two reads, it's going to be difficult for you the market. You know where this is going. Are you saying that good news is bad news in the I, labor market data? I, I hate to say that, but we're back to this world. I mean, we're, we're back to the world where a softer real economy 
will be more pleasing for the Fed and means that whatever their target is, five to five and a quarter, five to five and a half, is still the right target. The issue is if you get no softness in the labor market, and let's face it, we haven't seen any softness in the labor market in the aggregate data, then we're going to have to go higher. Because in the end, every Fed hiking cycle ends when the Fed funds rate is above CPI, and we are not there yet. Where are you thinking that the Fed funds is going? So we're going to get a summary of economic projections in the next Fed meeting. At the last Fed meeting where we had an SCP, which was back in September, they pushed the 23 dot from 3.8 to 4.6. I think most people assume that it goes to 5. Is there scope for surprise there? There is some scope for it to be a little bit higher than that, just because, as I've said, the services, the services inflation is not rolling over and the sticky services inflation is not rolling over. So while headline is and clearly the goods inflation has peaked and coming down hard, services has not. And that's 60 percent of CPI. So I think there's room to go higher. I think as you get higher on Fed funds, you're going to see a, a wider dispersion and you're going to see some some conversation in the FOMC about where we go from here. The, I think the easy part of the hiking cycle is, in a sense, behind us after this December meeting. And after that, you're going to start getting some dissents. What do you think is going to be the bigger surprise for markets if we get softer than expected uh, jobs prints or stronger or hotter than expected jobs prints? So I think the biggest surprise would be if we got hotter here. We ha we're having really high... Um, a net number of announcements of, of layoffs, and yet, and yet it's not showing up in the aggregate data at all. I mean, those those Thursday morning new claims data are hitting new lows, or you know, barely moving off of off, off lows. So it's not hitting the data yet. So I think if the if the numbers were hotter, it would it would be a surprise here. People are talking about short and shallow, and we've been talking about this all morning. That what is the consequence of this type of recession? How long will it last? And we were just speaking with Bill Dudley, who agrees with the idea of a longer and shallow type of recession. Is that an okay scenario for risk assets? So that's a great question, and this goes back to the difference between the real economy and risk assets. So even in a shallow recession, you can still have S&P earnings declines of 20%. And I, I'll just point to 2001 as a great example of that. Risk assets did not do well, even with a short and shallow recession. So I, there is still risk here. And in the end, you know, this year was about rates and multiple compression and, and, and the correlation between the, you know, the bond and equity market, you know, the worst being since 1931, that this is the transition year. Next year is, OK, now your rates are higher. What does it mean for the real economy? And that's, I think, we really have not priced in. I'm not the only one saying this, but it is true that the earnings really are too high and not essentially reflecting 500 basis points of tightening within 10 or 11 months. I mean, we've never really not hiked even. this fast. So, and we haven't seen the effect yet. So that is that is down the road and that is sure to come. Let's talk about leadership. Is it too early to talk about potential leadership for next year or not? So in a funny way, we have started to price in a recession around June, then again September, and now we're starting to price in a recovery. We haven't even gotten the recession. to the recession. <laughs> we haven't even gotten to realistic earnings numbers. So I, I don't think it's too early yet. I mean, there are certain sectors, there are certain companies that are just beaten down and left for dead. OK, and, and that is where you can go shopping for, for your stocks. Like we think the bond market is going to look much better next year simply because all the work was done this year. And historically, if you look at the 10 worst starts to the year in the bond market, you have a positive year the following year. And it, it makes sense if you think about it. I mean, it's related to the, the rolling over and the, and the inversion of the yield curve. Which you mentioned the early 2000s. Lead. Some of those names were left for dead for a long, long time. Yeah. Can you help me understand what should be left for dead for a long, long time? So speculation should be left for dead, right? So anything where it's multiple of revenue or, you know, that you know, no earnings, that, that will be left for dead probably forever. And I would suggest there'll be some consolidation in those areas. But that's not something to look forward to because there's many of these assets still have a ways to go. We're not there yet. Left for dead is when you're down 80 to 90 percent from the peak. So if you are in a speculative asset or a speculative name and you're hoping for, a, you know, that it's going to, you know, the market will stabilize one day, you actually still have, probably have another 20 percent to go on the downside here. What percent of the overall market cap of the S&P 
is that speculative uh, sort of quadrant that's going to be left for dead I don't, permanently? I, so I, I'd say my I think it's about it's about ten percent here. It's about ten percent. I think that some of the biggest risk and we've talked about this is the large cap names, which are still trading at higher multiples. You know, in the end, when you get a multiple compression year and you get the end of of the of the you know exuberance on the valuation side. You have to bring value investors back in to invest in these growth names, and some of our favorite growth names are still trading at pretty high multiples. Um, and so the top, the top of the market still has risk here. You can see it in how how the overall market in the aggregate has has, has traded the Dow versus the Nasdaq, the Dow versus the S and P. When the S and P is overly weighted, top ten names, twenty nine percent of the index. A lot of those names are still not cheap, and they're still expensive. I think Tom paid her to talk about the Dow. Well, we like to Dow. talk about the equal weight. Yeah, but, you, <laughs> but it's uh, it does make sense, though. The same point. Uh, it, it does. I think that I think that it is a, a good point going forward. Then, do you think that the potential for contagion is off the table, considering that we still have potentially more washout to go here? So I think there's still a risk of of sovereign debt issues in Europe. I think we are not through this winter. We are not through the nat gas problem of this winter. And then after this winter, there's a summer and another winter. And I think the market's very short-sighted in, in piecing this through and who's going to be paying for this and how it's going to be funded. That, these are not easy questions. And I think this is kind of an issue that's been left for dead because it's been a warmer than expected autumn in Europe. And so the reserves are high. But again, that's a one winter story. We don't have a plan yet moving forward. So I think there is some risk there. I think the contagion risk is lower, but not dead yet. I think that the Bitcoin blow up is likely to be contained there clearly with some counterparty risk, but I don't think it was a big enough asset for it to have huge reverberations. I agree with you on Europe. You've got to think about why the reserves are where they are. Nord Stream, are we going to have the same ability to build up those reserves through next summer? Doesn't seem so. Doesn't seem so right now. What do you do also in an economy where the inflation is coming from something completely out of control? of central banks and even of policymakers because it's being it's getting difficult for them to source enough natural gas from enough uh, places over the longer term with contracts that aren't necessarily 10 or 20 years. They worry about expectations. They worry about the second round of effects of inflation. Going into wage negotiations, those kind of things, ah, it's a tough spot for the Europeans. It will be next year as well based on where people think the energy market's going. Have people priced out? Some of that bare case, though, for Europe, based on oh, how much the sure. euro is traded. Can, I mean, how equi much equities yeah. in Europe are up, are up more than twenty percent yeah. off the lows. Well, look on at the, the European Euro stocks banks. 50. I yeah. mean, yeah. the most you Ripped. know, the most exposed asset over the last decade has rallied enormously. So, you know, risk assets are back on, and and the 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 recovery is getting priced in. And the question is, is this a bear trap? Right? Is this too early? Um, everybody likes picking the bottom and everybody thinks they have the turn. Sure. I just think that the nat gas, the funding, the sovereign debt issue, all related in Europe is not over yet. And the wage issue, as you point out, we have a wage issue here. Let's talk about the rail strike. OK, really quiet. Well, if 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 rail workers were really concerned about a deepening recession, they probably wouldn't be fighting for higher wages. Is the West here. Coast next. That's what I'd be asking. The ports negotiations, do they break down? I wonder if you're interested in a five-part dollar bond sale from Amazon, Alicia. I wonder if that gets you cutting. That headline just crossing the Bloomberg. Team USA, do they get it done later? Do they get it done, Team USA? Such an exi exciting game. Isn't I'm going to cool? say yes. There we go. Yes. Alicia Levine of BMY Mellon. <laughs> That's not conviction. Fired up. That's conviction. She's fired up. What so are you talking excited. about? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes, too. Well, it it's is great. just yes. Four years' time. <laughs> I know, in Lisa, the US. you and I will be able to go to the World Cup together here in New York. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that too. I'm going to take two weeks off, maybe the whole month. <laughs> From New York City, <laughs> futures up just about a tenth of 1%. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Federal Reserve policymakers are stressing that more interest rate hikes are on the way to curb inflation. New York Fed President John Williams told reporters that he sees rates he heading somewhat higher than he had just forecast a few months ago. Meanwhile, St. Louis Fed President James Bullard says that markets are underpricing the chance of higher rates. China plans to increase COVID vaccinations among its senior citizens. 
It's a step that health experts regard as crucial to reopening an economy stuck in harsh COVID zero restrictions. Still, Beijing stopped short of announcing mandates that helped raise inoculation rates in other countries. The move comes after a weekend of protests demanding an end to COVID limits. A bill in the U.S. Senate protecting same-sex marriage has cleared another procedural hurdle. A vote on final passage could take place this afternoon. If it passes, the measure then goes to the House. The bill would recognize same-sex marriages under federal law and ensure benefits for all married couples. HSBC has agreed to sell its Canadian unit to Royal Bank of Canada. The price, $10 billion in cash. The deal will allow RBC to expand its roster of business clients and bulk up its retail presence on the West Coast. The transaction represents a rare domestic acquisition for one of Canada's big banks. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Further tightening monetary policy should help restore balance between demand and supply and bring inflation back to 2% over the next few years. It will take some time, but I'm fully confident that we'll return to a sustained period of price stability. That was John Williams there, the New York Fed president. Live from New York City, let's get you some price action going into the opening bell. One hour and 12 minutes away. Equity futures higher by just 0.06%. That bounced this morning fate and fades quickly over the last 30 minutes or so. Yields are higher by a single basis point on a 10-year, 369.59. A turnaround there as well. Yields were lower by a couple of basis points. Something that sticks is that euro strength this morning. 103.65 positive a quarter of 1%. And what a turnaround it's been over the last few months on euro dollar. In fact, on everything against the US dollar, euro dollar at the lows at the end of September, 95.36, right now 103.65. Sterling at the lows of September 26th, 103.50, and right now 120. 21. Joining us now is Vasilios Janak, is the head of European FX strategy over at City. Vasilios, great to catch up with you. Great Let's talk you. about what went right, or rather, what went wrong for some of these calls around Sterling, which is now pushed through 120. Well, look, I think, first of all, there has been a fundamental reason in the sense that there has been the pricing out of the excessive risk premium uh, related to the uh, fiscal policies that were basically announced back at the end of uh, September. And the second thing, you know, during that period, there was an enormous buildup of uh, selling shorts. Um, and uh, given the fact that um, we are now in an environment of relative dollar weakness, sterling has pushed higher and you get the unwinding of these sterling shorts. As far as, I mean, if, if you want to gauge the direction of sterling, I wouldn't be looking at cable because cable, it's going to be the mirror image of, of what the dollar is doing. It's got to bet at the dollar of around one. I would be mostly looking at euro sterling. And, you know, I have to say I'm quite surprised that it's still hovering around 85, 86. So you would reload sterling shorts, but against yes, the euro? Uh, Yes, absolutely. Uh, but um, uh, the, the, the trigger point for me to do that is that I think we need to reach a point at which positioning, especially by the speculative community, is reaching relatively neutral levels. We're getting quite close to that if you look at the CFTC data as well as our proprietary uh, indices. Um, but I'm quite confident in that call for euro sterling higher. How much are you trying to move away from the dollar just in general in terms of your crosses, your pairs, just simply because the dollar story has been A, so dominant and B, so unpredictable? Um, I think 2023 is going to be <clears throat> a year in, in, in which relative value is going to make uh, uh, sense from a trading perspective. I think by far the biggest thing is going to be uh, the housing market. Uh, on the back of very strong monetary policy tightening, one needs to identify the places where housing markets are most vulnerable. Uh, and in us, at least in Europe, if you look, uh, Sweden and uh, the UK are by far the most vulnerable ones. Uh, but aside from that, I'd like to add that uh, uh, as far as the dollar call is concerned, I have to say that I'm inclined to believe that we're an inflection point in the dollar. It's the Fed and it's also the elephant in the room, which is China.
inflection point to a weaker dollar? To a weaker dollar, yes. I think uh, if you identify the state, the different states of the world, what really matters for the dollar is basically what the Fed is doing, but also what global growth is doing. And I think the market is sniffing that um, uh, basically the genie is out of the bottle as far as China reopening is concerned. So what do you think happens with China? What's your base I, case? Do you think full reopening? Well, it depends what you mean, full reopening. Uh, I think uh, there is going to be a very gradual reopening because it's not in the authorities' interest to do it overnight or very, very quickly. Um, there are a lot of political sensitivities in that respect. So I think there's going to be a very gradual reopening. We also have the very comprehensive property package, which is putting a floor underneath uh, property uh, prices, which will release some consumption impact by the wealth effect that potentially is going to start uh, putting some upside pressure on Chinese imports. But you know what? It's, it's, uh, I think the genie is out of the bottle as far as China is concerned. What do you think the best China proxy is to push that view through? Euro-China. Euro-China. Euro-China Euro upside. And, and the reason for that is at the initial stage of the gradual reopening, you're going to see an increase in inputs by China, which just means that you're going to have a deterioration in the current account of China. And on the flip side, you're going to start having a positive impact on the current account of the Eurozone. Uh, and in general, everything that um, uh, basically increases activity from China and Asia more uh, generally uh, is going to be good for the euro. So Euro-China, I think, is, is would be my best um, uh, trade for expressing that. Can you pair this into what you were talking about earlier about the housing market and how yeah. that dictates uh, the future of certain nations? And you point to Sweden and the UK. Translate, walk us through how a very weak housing market, what kind of deterioration you're expecting to really bleed into currency weakness. Well, uh, uh, as far as the um, a direct impact, that's a direct impact into uh, economic growth, and therefore there is direct impact uh, to consumption, and there's direct impact, therefore, to central bank decisions. Uh, we, uh, the, the Bank of England is very much aware of the properties in the housing market, and that's why it puts a lot of weight on growth right now, and that is why it seems unlikely, at least to us, that it's going to validate market expectations. Now, why these places are much more vulnerable, I mean, in the UK, you have to understand, in vast comparison, uh, uh, with in, in, in a great difference with, with the US, where here you have 30-year fixed rate mortgages. Uh, in the UK, you have two-year to five-year fixed rate mortgages, which means that every point in time, you get a bigger big, uh, a percentage of the population going out there to refinance. So, uh, you know, just compare it. You have had um, about two, two and a half percent uh, mortgage rates uh, in the past 10 years. Right now, you're potentially going to gravitate to six and a half to seven percent. So uh, it's going to be a major, major hit. It's going to be brutal. You see it in the numbers already. UK mortgage approvals. Yes. I think the lowest since COVID-19. How bad do you think this is going to get in the housing market in the UK? My view is that it's, it's going to get very bad. And the, the other issue uh, that the UK is now facing is that um, uh, it's actually facing a more structural problem into the inflation outlook uh, compared to the rest of the world. And the reason for that, um, you know, we've said that, I think it's to a large extent related to Brexit. And, and as a result of this, uh, it will put the, uh, the, the Bank of England in a much, much more difficult spot compared to other central banks. It will be faced with a structurally higher uh, inflation and a much uh, faster deteriorating economy. Governor Bailey speaking a little bit later this morning, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Yeah, to the House of Lords. And how much does he discuss the ramifications on the housing market that could be decimated, but not just because of interest rates, but also just because... And the gender and economy. Seeing. And did you see Goldman Sachs moving what did they some say? of their uh, employees Milan. of London to Milan, partly because of this? But Look, I think uh, what was really unprecedented uh, was in the, during the last press conference uh, by the Bank of England, Bailey actually said, um, I hope uh, that uh, the market is getting the message and mortgage <laughs> rates are going to go lower after an interest rate hike. I find it confusing <laughs> from the Bank of England at times. I... I don't know. Vasilis Janak is a city. It's great to catch up, sir. Thank you. Thanks Wonderful. Very much. Futures up by about a tenth of 1% on the SP. Yields higher by almost a basis point. Live from New York, heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg.
One hour away from the opening bell, equity futures are just about positive, up a tenth of one percent. The broader price action looks a little something like this. Yields are by almost a basis point on a 10-year, 369.40 on a 10-year yield. Euro dollar positive two tenths of one percent, 103.58. Didn't get that downside surprise on German CPI, but it did ease relative to last month in line with what we saw Lisa from Spain a little bit earlier this morning as well, going into the ECB and, in a couple of weeks. And you're seeing a real move in the uh, European bond market Big in move. response to this. Really, it's just the idea that you're getting a uh, softer than expected inflation print driving home much more than any rhetoric from ECB officials. Again, a sort of similar story to the U.S. where the data speaks louder than monetary policy centers. Yields lower in Germany and across Europe. The outlook from Bank of America out in the last week or so. Mike Apen and the team looking at the global economy. A recession is very likely, Lisa, in the US, the Eurozone and the UK. All other regions will continue to weaken with the exception of China. Inflation will come down, but it will take time for central banks to declare victory. The outlook's not looking great, is it, for 23? And a lot of it hinges on China, how bad it will be or potentially what shoots could come in terms of demand. It all hinges on China, which is the reason why we've been focusing so much on how difficult it is to game out how they're going to deal with COVID zero and where that's going to leave the economy. Just going through this final bullet point from BFA, the outlook is much more uncertain than normal. And we continue to worry about geopolitical shocks and sticky high inflation. I think it is much more uncertain than normal. I'm not sure how much value is in a 23 outlook at the best of times, but at the moment it just feels like a lot of these outlooks that you were rewrite month after month, week after week. I think Stephen Major's uh, outlook was interesting for exactly this point where it was different outcomes, probabilities of them, and then what the scenarios look like. So it's gaming out how people will respond to different outcomes that we cannot predict. That might be the new format for the 2023 outlook at sure. this point. Or the outlooks for the next several years. Yeah. Greg Dacco joins us now, Chief Economist at EY Parthenon. Great to catch up with you, Greg. Let's just start with uh -huh. what Lisa mentioned about 30 minutes ago. What do you think is more important this week, the Chairman Powell address or the data in the labour market? I think both are, are equally important. Uh, we're going to get from the, the labor market increased evidence that there is a slowdown in the labor market in the U.S. Uh, it's not yet visible uh, in a broad basis in terms of, of the latest data that we've had. We've seen a slowdown in the pace of hiring, uh, but it's still positive. I would expect that as we move into 2023, we're likely to see a bit of a turn in sentiment and increased evidence of, of layoffs, so pullback in the labor market. But it's not quite evident in the data yet. Powell's speech will, will also be important because right now we have this paradox where markets are pricing the Fed to go probably as high as 5% with the Fed funds rate, but implement a couple of rate cuts on the back end of next year. The Fed wants to lean hard against that narrative. It wants markets to believe that it will go to 5% and potentially higher, but then more importantly, hold at that level over the course of 2023. That's not currently priced into markets. How do you think that's going to get picked up in the projections from the Fed on December 14th, Greg? I'm not just looking at unemployment, I'm looking at growth too. They've got unemployment in 23 at 4.4%. They have growth in their last set of projections for 2023 at 1.2%. And that is way above some of the projections I'm seeing on the street, Greg. What do you make of that divide? Well, I think what the Fed wants to do right now is, is switch from a, a speed paradigm to a destination paradigm. So it's going to want to indicate that it will reach a higher terminal Fed funds rate, higher than the 4.6% that was in the September uh, economic projections, and look at a Fed funds rate that's likely to be higher than 5%. But at the same time, the Fed is likely to indicate that it will tolerate an unemployment rate that rises perhaps above 5%, a growth that will likely be weaker, uh, if not slightly negative over the course of 2023 and uh, generally an environment in which we're going to have uh, a likely recession. As you were telling us right before this, we are in a highly uncertain global environment. Um, and I think we have to be careful and humble about the fact that there is that tremendous uncertainty as to the direction of the US economy and of global economies overall, because a global recession is generally larger than the sum of its parts. So if every economy, every large economy around the world, China, Europe, uh, and the U.S. are heading into a recession, that's likely to pull global activity. And that's a downside risk uh, to economic activity overall. Regardless of the uh, the nature of when we get the recession, do you expect this to be a short and shallow, the way that a lot of people have been talking about? Or will, do you expect this to be a more prolonged downturn? 
truth is we, we really don't know, Lisa. I mean, we are in an environment where there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty regarding the global economic outlook. Um, I've talked before about this hat trick of uh, forecasts uh, in the context of the World Cup, but we have a consensus that there will be a recession, that it's likely to happen in the very near term, and that's going to be mild and shallow. I mean, if that were to happen, that would be the hat trick of uh, forecasts for forecasters, but uh, we don't know. I mean, there is certainly upside risk in terms of the resilience of the economy today. We still have a labor market in the U.S. that's adding a decent number of jobs. We still have consumers that are spending, but spending at a slower pace. Um, and we still have this high inflation environment. There could be an unraveling of financial conditions. There could be a turnaround in the labor market starting next year. And there could be more caution on the part of consumers pulling back on their expenses, which would make this recession a bit deeper. And we have to remember that the context on the policy front is one that's likely to be less supportive of economic activity. We're not going to get a big bailout for Congress in this high inflation environment. So it's hard to get a handle on what's going to happen. It's also hard to get a handle on what's actually happening, especially when you take a look at housing prices. And I go there because Vasilios Giannakis was talking about that being a massive driver of currency differentials uh, and growth next year. I'm looking and I'm waiting for the S&P CoreLogic Case Shiller 20 City Composite City House Price. I just wanted to <laughs> You add, can't even say the full John, name of that data it. without well, laughing I mean, anymore, it's, can it's, you? It's, you, you? You've absolutely <laughs> blown it for me. They do need to rebrand. We'll get your view, Greg, on what they should rebrand to. But how quickly is this housing market in the U.S. deteriorating and how much further do you see it going? I think it has some further downside uh, in terms of overall home sales and then housing starts uh, that are likely to follow suit. Um, we are in an environment where the affordability of homes has deteriorated quite sharply. That is preventing new home buyers from entering the market. It's making investors think twice about entering the market. Uh, so we're likely to see this ongoing weakness in the housing market, which will feed over time into prices. I think one key element that we have to highlight and, and, and note the possibility is that while inflation persistence has been the key theme for the last 18 months, we should be careful that in an environment where economic activity is slowing globally and when some of these sectors are actually turning around fairly rapidly, there could be more of a drag on inflation going into next year. And we could be in for a faster decline in inflation in the back end of next year. And I think that's something to pay close attention to, especially in this context where you have a lot of uncertainty regarding monetary policy. It's a dangerous game wherever there's confidence in the global economy over the last couple of years. That's for sure, Greg. Is that the point? that you think we should be most humble about going into 23? I think that's absolutely the point. I mean, we're, we're talking about a framework of navigating this world of uncertainty here at EY, um, and we're advising our clients to look at multiple scenarios. Having one key baseline is not enough in the current environment. You really need to look at a multitude of scenarios that could unfold over the next 12 to 24 months. If you have built that resilience to navigate this world of uncertainty, then you're going to be better equipped to take advantage of whatever conditions appear over the next six to 12 months. It's not about banking on one specific scenario. It's being prepared, resilient on the resilience on the talent front, resilience on the organizational front, on the pricing front. All of these factors are very important to be able to navigate this highly uncertain and highly volatile macroeconomic backdrop. What's the one consideration, Greg, heading into 2023? Is it China reopening? Is it the price of energy? Is it the war in Ukraine that really sets some of your base cases? Well, it's really lying at the intersection of macroeconomics and, and geopolitics. Uh, we are in an environment where uh, when you look at what's happening across the world in China with the zero COVID policy, with the political um, reappointment of, of President Xi. When you look at what's happening in the property sector in China, that is having a big impact, not just on China's economic activity, but also on the broader context in Asia. If you look at what's happening in Europe, we still have elevated tensions, and that's feeding into the energy complex, that's feeding into the food complex, it's feeding into the supply chain strains. And then when you look at what's happening in the U.S., you also have this intersection of political developments and economic developments. And all of those combined make for this very uncertain environment. So there's not necessarily one pocket of risk that we have to monitor. It's really monitoring the whole spectrum of risks around the world and the intersection of geopolitics and macroeconomics is really the key to understanding the outlook and making sure you're well-equipped, well-prepared to navigate that environment. Greg, wonderful to catch up with you today, buddy. As always, Greg Dacko there of EY Parthenon. Speaking of some of the risks that Greg's talking to, 
This is from Andrew Hollenhorst, The City, this morning. The House, urged by President Biden, will move forward with legislation to force rail worker unions to accept an agreement that includes a 20% plus wage increase over five years after four of eight unions failed to approve it earlier. With the deadline of December 9th and a 60-vote threshold in the Senate, passing the legislation may be difficult. Lisa, he goes on to say a potential alternative would be lengthening the cooling off period. This is going to become a bigger story potentially in America. If rails end up not becoming functional, that will cause prices to surge dramatically heading into year end. A lot of people have gamed this out because this is the main way that a lot of goods get transported around the nation. That is the reason why President Biden is trying to uh, go ahead with this. Very curious to see also the fact that Citigroup is talking about Bullard and Williams both talking about this. I wonder how much they end up really trying to respond to this, or do they end up pulling an Andrew Bailey and trying to basically say, you know, if you guys do that, we're going to have to raise rates even more because, you know, we have to counter the inflationary push. Yeah, I don't want to hear central banks get involved in pay negotiations. <laughs> Isn't that something they've just got to respond to? <laughs> I know. Not, not but give if, advice about. Okay, but if you respond to it, right, you're responding to it by raising rates. Have you seen what some of these guys are running as central banks? when they go and do a speech after they've left the Fed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you have you seen that? some of the earnings of Bernanke and Yellen post-Federal Reserve? Uh, this is not enough time to discuss this. I know it's that like you have disdain. But dis how disdain? Do you, but how do you... I'm, I'm very happy that people but, go out and earn money. I've got I, no problem with that at all. What's the motivation to go into public service if they can't make bank assets? It's not my point. I just think as a policymaker, <laughs> I don't think you're in a good position to be commenting on how much people should... Earn. No, no, no. That, I would agree with that. I That's think that everyone agrees on that. Thank you. Tony Rodriguez is coming up of Nuveen, alongside Gershon Distenfeld, of Alliance Bernstein, and Victoria Green of G Squared Private Wealth. All coming up in the next hour, Lisa. So is the S&P CoreLogic 20 City home price. Someone next. will break that down in 20 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> from New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, as you've just heard, President Biden and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi are moving forward to prevent a strike that would shut down the nation's freight railroads. The House is preparing to take up legislation to impose a labor settlement. Despite the objections of some unions, a rail strike could hurt the economy by crippling supply chains. NATO is discussing how to improve Ukraine's defenses against Russia over the winter. Speaking in Romania, the alliance's secretary general vowed that NATO will stand for Ukraine as long as it takes. This is a critical time for our security, and we are sending an important message. NATO is here, NATO is vigilant, and NATO is ready to defend every inch of allied territory. Stoltenberg also said the war has demonstrated what he called the dangerous dependence on Russia gas. OPEC and its allies are expected to consider deeper output cuts when they meet this weekend. Saudi Arabia and its partners surprised traders when they announced a 2 million barrel a day cutback last month. Still, prices have faltered since then as demand weakens. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Curve is definitely telling you a recession is, is coming. It's not here yet, but the check is certainly in the mail. Two tens that inverted, Fed funds tens now inverted with further hikes coming. That tells you a recession probably a lot. Probably uh, the least contested point of the year that there will be a recession in the United States and that it probably will happen next year. Matt Dizak, Merrill and Bank of America Private Bank, head of Chief Investment Office uh, Fixed Income Strategy, joining us yesterday. This is, to me, one of the most interesting points that everyone seems to be saying there will be a recession. So if everyone agrees on it, will it happen? Joining us now, Jim Bianco. I want to get straight to him because he's got fascinating points. Founder and president of Bianco Research. Jim, let's start there. There's going to be a recession in this next year, is there? Well, it's been more discounted than any time in the 50-year history of the Philadelphia Fed survey. So everybody expects a uh, recession. And because of that, everybody expects the Fed to pivot. They'll be cutting rates in the second half of the year. 
And everybody expects that what's going to drive that is going to be falling inflation. We all love to whisper to each other, you know, the inflation rate is going to come in much lower in the second half of next year. We all see that. And really what's happened is transitory never went away. So we're going to have a recession. Inflation is going to fall. The Fed's going to pivot. And that's what We appear to be having some technical difficulties with Jim. We'll try him again and see if we can reestablish that. But what he was saying there was fascinating, that basically there is this stealth transitory that has been taking hold of markets. And perhaps that's part of what's underpinning the belief in rate cuts next year, which is what the market is indicating, despite the Fed's protestations, where they're basically saying, no way, they're not going to cut rates next year because they need to combat inflation uh, where it is right now and bring it back down to 2 percent. The stealth inflation has been a concern, and we've been talking about it all morning, that the short and shallow, is that the new transitory, right, that, that we're going to basically be able to come out of this quickly because inflation will right-size itself. And one thing that Fed officials keep saying again and again is that, no, it will not. This is different. It has a more persistent feel to it, and that is the reason why we have to hold rates at 5 percent or more for the entirety of 2023. The market is pushing back because of exactly what Jim Bianco uh, was just saying. They basically Basically, we're just saying, Jim Bianco was just saying uh, that the stealth argument, the stealth transitory argument is still underpinning so much of market action. Since we've been talking, the S&P uh, was up in pre-market trading. It's now basically flat. The euro is uh, up against the dollar. It really has been more of a dollar story than a euro story. That's what a lot of people are saying. 103.51 there. Yields just a touch higher, 371.44, uh, and crude a bit higher as well. Crude also underpinning so much of the story with people saying uh, that that could potentially give more buying power to consumers. That's what Evan Brown was saying of UBS Asset Management, that if you give more buying power to consumers come next year, you could end up with a stronger economy than many people had previously expected because they can keep going out and spending. And we heard again uh, from other people that we do have uh, some sort of uh, the the inflation that we see with respect to uh, the Social Security payments as well that are going to be risen, I believe, more than 8 percent come next year. John, what Jim was just talking about, that stealth inflation, Jonathan Farrow joining us from his other location, uh, really is interesting and probably underpinning what we hear from so many people about rate cuts next year. I thought I'd gone away. You just bring me back in. I can't help myself, John. You know what they think the risk is now? And you hear it from Loretta Mester, and she was speaking to Colby Smith over at the FT yesterday, and it comes down to risk management. And I think we heard it from Chairman Powell in the last news conference. They still believe that the risk of doing too little outweighs the risk of doing too much. And their biggest fear is that they move away prematurely and you have a flip-flopping scenario that Mohammed al Arian warned about earlier this summer. That takes us back to the 1970s. And I think you heard that loud and clear from Loretta Mester yesterday in the FT when the Cleveland Fed president said the costs are stopping too early are high. We want to be very diligent about this. With that framework, there is a risk here, Lisa, and some people are extremely worried about this. So this Fed is committed to over-tightening. And some people think they've already gone too far. And we heard that from David Rosenberg about an hour ago. And Jim Bianco was just referencing that, this idea that under their breasts they whisper, it's coming down a lot more, don't worry about it. And that's what we keep hearing from everyone. John, I will let you go and prep, but, you know, I had to bring you back because, you know, that's what I do. Michael McKee, also here, Chief Economics Correspondent for Bloomberg Television uh, and Radio. And, and, Mike, as we hear about this, as we hear about the Fed officials pushing back and we hear about the stealth tightening, do you think that people are starting to say it more loudly and that there are certain Fed officials that are listening that perhaps inflation is rolling over faster than they expected? Well, I think they're all listening and they're all looking and they're all keeping their fingers crossed. The problem is, is you don't know. And it could be a one-time thing or they could be surprised again. And since they were surprised with the uh, transitory that didn't happen, they're going to be much more cautious going forward. But a lot of them have said that uh, there is not only more tightening in the global system than is reflected in the markets, but there is also a good chance that inflation starts to come down in many categories very quickly. The problem is, is uh, of course, the Fed looks at the PCE index as their metric, and the CPI is going to come down more slowly because of the way housing is in that uh, index. And so it's a balancing act, too, between what the public is going to focus on and what the Fed sees sort of behind the scenes. 
the labor market. We get labor market data tomorrow as well as Jay Powell speaking uh, at, I believe, 1.30 p.m. Uh, tomorrow at the Brookings PM, Institute yes. for uh, for a panel there. We do get the JOLTS data, which I think is going to be really interesting. And then on Friday, uh, we get the jobs report. What are you watching most closely? This is something we've been talking about all morning. I mean, people say Jay Powell speaking, but all of the Fed speak hasn't seemed to matter. And it has been the data in the front seat for the most part. Yeah, it's still the data in the front seat. And I think JOLTS is going to be important in the sense that people want to know, are job uh, openings starting to go away because the Fed's focused its whole uh, its sort of policy on the idea that the labor market is tight because there are so many job openings and we've seen it bounce around a little. So does that really uh, start to change? Uh, and then, of course, we get the jobs report, and unemployment is what people are going to be watching because the Fed has said it's going to go higher. And a lot of people who make the case that the Fed's going too far say it's going to reflect, uh, unemployment's going to reflect a lot of people losing jobs pretty soon. The problem with unemployment is it's a lagging indicator, and it takes sometimes several quarters uh, before uh, the uh, unemployment rate really starts to rise. So it may not be a completely reliable predictor this time. And then, of course, I'll throw in that last caveat that I keep doing is this is a very weird time coming out of this pandemic, and there are no models that really tell us what's going to happen. Okay, so then perhaps just weigh in quickly on something that you can give a concrete answer on. If the S&P CoreLogic Case-Shiller 20-City Composite City Home Price Index were to rebrand, what do you think the rebranding should be to have a more kind of digestible name? I still call it Case-Shiller. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we'll go with. Case-Shiller, I mean, the definitive it's been so view. Long. Yeah. Yeah. That, that it's there. I'm sorry to the S&P folks. I know that they want to get their name on there. But. <laughs> All right. The case chiller. Michael McKee, thank you. Rejecting the rebrand and uh, debranding. Coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Ra Radio, Mary Kay Henry, international president of the Services Employees International Union, a fascinating conversation at a moment where there still is this question of whether that agreement that President Biden is urging will get passed through Congress to bring all of the unions to the table. Citigroup's Andrew Hollenhorst raising questions about whether he has enough support for that agreement that includes a 25 percent wage increase over the next five years. In markets, we do see a bit of softening in futures coming off the earlier highs. 39.67. This is Bloomberg.